We now begin our programming on Shaw Community 11. Seesaw battle in game one. Paul Day ties the game at seven with under five minutes remaining. The hometown fans, they tighten their seatbelt. It's going to be quite a finish. Marinchak misses from in close. Mike Simpson with the rebound. The captain gets out to Chris Pratt. Pratt fires home the game winner between the legs of Bob Watson. Tyson Elias adds an empty net goal, and the Rocks roll to a 9-7 win, drawing first blood in the series. Game two, the physical intensity picks up, but the real story in the match, Bob Watson, Gamblers goalie stones Alton Davis here on a clear-cut breakaway, holding the Gamblers in the game and in the lead. Third period, all Gamblers, Randy Mearns, he's perched on the doorstep, first times one pass, Marty O'Neill, then Jason Luke, the OLA Rookie of the Year, he turns on the Jets, finishes off a 2-1-1 pass break, Gamblers take game two, evening the series. Game three, and after eight periods of championship lacrosse, the Rocks finally solve Gamblers goaltender Bob Watson. Dal Halliday draws first blood, then Gary Gate, two in a row. Over the shoulder, great effort here. Then Gate from further out, three goals in less than three minutes. That chases Watson to the showers. Rocks go on to score seven unanswered third period goals, taking a 2-1 series lead. Game four, Rocks picked up where they left off in the game three. Gary Gates scoring the first goal. Spectacular shorthanded effort, 2.51 in. Then Rick Brown snaps home a long-range effort at 11 minutes. Rocks roll to a 5-0 first period lead. Second period, the domination continues. Gamblers come back, no chance. Here's Tom Marichek, shorthanded, a brilliant diving effort. Goal of the series, perhaps. Rocks player of the game, Fred Jenner then. He, he goes back door, receives the pass, in tight, and between the legs. Rocks are just on fire. They had three more in the second, seven more in the third period. Absolutely pound the Gamblers, a 17-2 win. Rocks with a 3-1 series lead. Stranglehold perhaps on the Man Cup within one win of bringing home Victoria's first Canadian senior men's lacrosse title in 14 years. Game four, 17-2, Shamrock shellacking was something special for local lacrosse fans. And like the musical milestone from almost 30 years ago, no doubt 10 or 20,000 Victorians will say they were really at the arena like the millions of aging baby boomers who claim they saw Woodstock. Well, tonight, only 5,000 plus will witness the coronation on Caledonia. Or will they? At Friday's press conference, Coach Gamblers coach Terry Sanderson said his team owes it to the game to come back and rebound. And they did, in fact, in the OLA final, coming back from a 17-4 loss to, in fact, win that series. But tonight, will the Gamblers' best effort be enough against the talented, deep Shamrocks lineup with momentum rolling like an avalanche? Live from Memorial Arena, it's Game 5 of the Man Cup. bus coming to you live from the arena floor here of course at victoria memorial arena an expectant crowd just waiting for the action to begin as we deal with some pomp and pageantry to open game five three factors for the rocks tonight depth execution and momentum rolling like a freight train maybe too much for the gamblers we'll have to see what happens we've got chris hall and scott earl upstairs guys what do you think well norma an electric night here at memorial arena again and chris hall nice to have you back with us 
You've been here with the Shamrocks as a player and a coach to win a Man Cup. This is the first opportunity tonight we've seen for one of these teams to clinch this series tonight. The Shamrocks up three games to one. What kind of emotions are going on under the floor there tonight? Well, uh, I think uh, alternate sets of emotions. Uh, first of all, the Shamrocks in great anticipation of finally, after 14 years, reaching the pinnacle and maybe tasting some champagne tonight out of the cup. It's, but it's very difficult to come out and, and, and try to get yourself going, knowing that 60 minutes uh, you can finally uh, reach the cup and win it. Uh, for the gamblers, of course, boy, they're, uh, they are in a bit of a hole. They look back and they say, can we come out of a 3-1 deficit and come back in Memorial Arena and come in front of 5,000 fans? So a large task for the gamblers, but still it's very difficult to win that last game. That's for sure. Well, Chris, it's become a tradition now, and uh, we'll get to Chris's keys right after the national, national anthem after this. Chris, I started to say it's become a tradition at the top of these Shaw Cable Man Cup broadcasts to look at Chris's keys, our keys, or your keys, to the game tonight. Let's look at those right now. What's the important thing first for the gamblers tonight? Well, the gamblers, as we said, are in a deep hole tonight, and uh, the last game only two goals, and certainly they got shut out in the third period of game three. So I think for the gamblers, first off, they really got to look to more scoring from the Kilgore brothers and Randy Mearns. Uh, certainly, Darris has been doing his share of the scoring for the gamblers. He's got five goals so far uh, for them. But uh, between Randy Mearns and Travis Kilgore and Rich Kilgore, they've only got three goals apiece. And they've really got to start, start putting the ball in the net for them. And Darris Kilgore, if I may add, Chris, was a, a potential scratch for tonight, but he is out there in the lineup. Yeah, he's hurting a little bit. He's there. He said he's got a little bit of a limp going now. You can see on the screen, Darius has a bit of a hip pointer going, a sore hip, but he's out there. He knows uh, this is the last gasp for the gamblers, and he's going to give it everything he has. There you see Rich Kilgore. Rich missed the first two games of the series and uh, showed up in game three. Uh, a couple of great shots from outside, but hasn't been able to crack Marty O'Neill yet. And Randy Mearns has played all games in the series and has been dangerous a few times, but just hasn't been able to find the scoring touch yet. I really think they need uh, some answers from him. Okay, keys for the Shamrocks if they're going to take it all home tonight. Well, the Shamrocks uh, have to really continue with their aggressive checking. Uh, there's no doubt about uh, that's what got them going in game uh, two in the third, or game three in the third period that really finally got them out of the shell they were in. And in secondary, I think really for the Shamrocks, they really can't stand around and go back to what they did in game one. And, and game two when they stood and watched the superstars gate Marichek. They really have depth in their lineup and that's what got them where they were going early in the uh, third period of game three and then in the fourth. Uh, the Gamblers, once again, I think the one thing they've got to do tonight is slow the ball down. I think uh, Coach Terry Sanderson has a run-and-gun team, but, you know, I think if they tried that game and they showed it in game three and four, that if they try to run and play that open style of cross with the Shamrocks, it's uh, not a good recipe for them. So I think they're going to play that defense and slow it down as much as they can. The officials for tonight's game, Rick Lum and Don Brocky, and game five is underway of the Man Cup. You're watching live on the whole Shaw Cable Network tonight. Welcome to Victoria's Memorial Arena. The Niagara Falls Gamblers now with the ball, starting out of their own zone, wearing the white uniforms with black and red trim and defending the goal to our left. The Victoria Shamrocks playing at home, trying to win it all tonight in their white uniforms with green and gold trim, defending the goal to our right. Starting goaltenders Marty O'Neill 
and Bob Watson, as you would expect. They've both started every game for their teams. There's an early save for Marty O'Neill, but the shooter was in the crease. Possession goes back to the Shamrocks. We're 42 seconds into the game, no score. I'd like to welcome all our viewers on also the Rogers Cable Network in British Columbia tonight. Glad to have you with us, and so many of you with us tonight. Chris Pratt tried a shot, but again the turnover with the ball going back to Niagara Falls. And early in the game, Scott, Bob Watson's had to make three save, saves already. He's stood in the pass. He looks big and strong. He's ready to play. The gamblers, as I said, aren't about to give the cup up without a strong fight. Well, the Shamrocks take possession again. No one with a uh, real good scoring chance yet early here in the first period of game five. That is Neil Doddridge with the ball, one of three players in the game tonight who are Man Cup champions the previous five seasons consecutively. There's Tom Marichek in front, who you saw score a spectacular goal in our opening tonight. Really, we think the goal of the series so far. There's a shot from Darren Rising outside. He gets the rebound, but can't control it. Back of the net he goes. And now the ball goes back to Niagara Falls. Well, an exciting opening so far. Both teams going at it right away, Scott. Uh, five, six shots on goal already. Goaltending is standing strong. Well, the Galmers with the ball again. Now that's Scott Ronson outside. Gives it to Ryan Jimerson. Back to Ronson again. And we mentioned the Gamblers will try and slow the game down, and they've used all the shot clock here. Now it will expire as that shot is well wide and bounces up into the crowd. Well, after game four, the 17-2 drubbing, uh, Coach Terry Sandow was looking down his bench uh, during that game, trying to pull something out of the hat, and there wasn't much there. So I think that's probably their best offense right now is really as slow as possible. Well, there's Gary Gate, who we talked about in the keys, going to the net. He scores! Gary Gate, as we've seen him do so many times, muscles his way around. Well, Gary Gate got isolated on Steve Pinnell. Steve Pinnell's been checking him the whole series and doing a good job, but you can't check Gary Gate one-on-one, -on -one, four, five, and six games in a row without Gary Gate getting his points. And Gary just simply one-on-one -on -one with Pinnell, powered by, by, powers by him with his strength and ability and puts it by Watson. Here you see the replay. Gates out past Watson underneath him, picks a spot on Bob and opens the scoring. Well, there's another shot in front for Gary Gate and a nice save by Bob Watson. Gary Gate gets the goal from Grant Hamilton and Darren Rizek to open the scoring. Gate's 12th goal of the series. And, and Gate almost came right back with another chance and Watson made a great save. Gary Gate leading all scorers with 12 goals and also the point leader in the series as well. Uh, Grant Johnson, number 20, and terrific defense there by Rod Tapp, who's had a strong series at both ends of the floor. Gary Gate moves in all alone, scores! Gary Gate with tremendous moves in front of the net. Bob Watson left helpless in the goal. Well, super defense by Rod Tapp at the other end with four seconds left in the shot clock. Tapp steals the ball, sees Gate breaking down the floor, and Gate once again with his power and strength here, you see, one-on-one. -on -one. Left-handed power and strength goes right by. Escapes the over-the-head check, one fake, and then back to the strong side on Watson. Well, there you see some of the talent of Gary Gate. You're seeing it early and often so far. 2-0 early for the Shamrocks. Shamrocks really starting off where they've ended up the last four periods of lacrosse. Scott and the Gamblers have really got to try and slow something down here. Well, Tab gets the only assist on... Gate second goal, Greg Pepper right in now, and he has the ball knock off his stick. Travis Kilgore gets it, number 22. One of the three Kilgore brothers we talked about in the opening. Niagara Falls looking for big things from them, and they'll need it now. Down 2 nothing early, pushing and shoving on the far side between Darius Kilgore and the fan favorite, Bruce Alexander. Kilgore takes a punch to the face of Alexander, and he's going to get a penalty, I think. Referee Rick Lum on the far side trying to get Kilgore's attention. Now he goes to the bench, but the penalty gate is open, and they're going to call him back to go through the player's gate again, across the floor to the penalty bench. 
Another thing we mentioned earlier in the series that the gamblers really can't afford to be in the penalty box. This is where the Shamrocks really have some superior skills. Uh, their power play really started to gel in game four. Coach Nirmal Dillon made some adjustments, uh, put Gary Gate out to the top of the power play. And since Gary's been out the top, he really has opened up some shooting lanes for the other ball players. Uh, Gary started the series in the shooter spot, and the Shamrock power play really seemed stagnant. But since Gary's gone to the top, they've really started to produce. Now we're still trying to sort out the penalties here, Scott. And it looks like two Shamrocks are in the box. Bruce Alexander, and they've got Tyson Lyons' number up there and four minutes on the Shamrock side of the board. I think we're going to take a look at Gary. Here's Gary Gates' goal, another shot of that. So it's his power and strength goes by. An attempted over the head check, missed it. Fake to get him up in the weak side corner, and then he goes down to the strong side, stick side. And Lots of room after he got Watson up in the air on the fake. Well, that was Rich Kilgore, the last defender that Gate went around there and really made him look like a pylon out there. Gary Gate showing tremendous skill early on, just as we knew he would. Well, it looks like it's going to be coincidental minors now, although the gambler's bench is, the uh, player, the penalty box, sorry, is still open. They're obviously holding it open, expecting someone else to enter the sin bin over there. And here comes Andy Turner now. Well, now it's going to be Randy Mearns instead. And Randy Mearns is hot under the collar, arguing with referee Rick Lum over there. Lum just about ready to, uh, he's given Mearns a misconduct already in this series. He's saying, get in the box now. Oh, well, now it's Andy Turner is going in. Randy Mearns simply arguing on his behalf. Well, we get a four-on-three situation here now, Scott. And as we mentioned before, this is uh, where the Shamrocks are really at their best when they're at their special team situations, both when they're man down and man up. Well, coming into the game tonight, the uh, Man Cup scorers were mostly Shamrocks, as you would guess if you'd watched some of our coverage up until now. Gary Gate came into the game with 18 points. Of course, he's up to 20 now. Tom Marichek has 13. Darius Kilgore, 11. Dell Halliday with nine. And Neil Doddridge with eight. To round out the top five scores in the tournament, those were numbers going into tonight's game. Gary Gate, especially, has altered those somewhat. So the extra penalty goes to the Gamblers. The Shamrocks find themselves on the power play. Marichek out front, over for Gate, makes a shot. Nice save by Bob Watson on the shot from Gate. Watson will feel better after stopping Gary Gate after Gate won the first two battles tonight. As we see, the Shamrocks will set up with the turnover of the Gamblers. The Shamrocks will set up in a box, two shooters outside, two in the crease, and play against a triangle. But they get a quick two-on-one, and Darren Rizek puts it away. Darren Rizek fires the third goal, and you know, the Shamrocks have really been on a big roll since the start of the third period of Game 3, and it just continues, Chris. And I find the other Shamrocks who can put the ball in the net, the Rizek, the Holidays, the Pratt's, the Doddridge's, the list goes on, and I think the Gamblers are now seeing that. Here you see the two-on-one break. Rising's got a man with him, freezes the defender in front of the net. He's got to play the passer, fakes the pass, and just finds the hole between Bob Watson's legs. Shamrock's third goal, power play goal, scored by number 32, Darren Another point for Gary Gate is the assist on the goal by Darren Rizek to make it 3 0. Now the Shamrocks with pressure again. Marichek a high shot off the shoulder of Bob Watson. Rich Kilgore in there now wearing the C for the Gamblers tonight. Passes it over for Derek Graham who starts out. Well, we said in the opening, Chris, that the Gamblers would have to slow the game down, but now down 3 0, they may have to start trying to open it up, and that's been a problem for them in this series. Well, I think, too, that's when they when they have gotten down, they've had been forced to open it up, but I really can't, don't think they can play that game. I really think they just got to maintain their patience and poise because if they really get into run and gun here now, it would be a blowout. Tyson Elias now over to Gary Gate. Four on four as the coincidental minors are still in effect. Gate right in again. Oh, and a nice save on the backhand shot. Gary Gage shows us yet another move that we haven't seen so far tonight. And trust me, folks, he's got a lot more in his bag. Heads to the gate, to the penalty bench now. Does gate. 
as the Shamrocks prepare to play defense. Randy Mearns moving right in, shoots. Nice save. First tough save of the night for Marty O'Neill. And we see Randy Mearns showing his stick prowess by switching hands on that shot, and he's one of the one players that we alluded to the outset of the game that's got to put the ball in the net for the Gamblers. Chris Pratt gets it into the corner for Dell Halliday, but the pass was too high for him. Halliday knocks it loose, but it goes to Travis Kilgore in front of the goal. Fred Jenner checking him there. Now the ball's in the possession of Dave Smith playing his first game tonight. Rookie of the year this year, Jason Luke in the Ontario Lacrosse Association. Uh, missed the end of, in fact, most of game four and is not in the lineup tonight. In fact, he's out for the series with a knee injury. He will be missed. So the addition to the roster tonight, number nine, Dave Smith, who you see on the floor right now. 13-17 to go here in the first period. Live from Memorial Arena in Victoria, B.C. It's the Man Cup, game five, Shamrocks three, Gamblers nothing. Shot, shot so far in the game. 9-3 for the Shamrocks, as you would expect. Most of the game so far played in the half of the arena to our left. Now Fred Jenner has got a two-minute penalty for the Shamrocks. He's headed to the penalty box, and the Gamblers will have their first power play of the night. Section 13, row D, seat 11. 13, D, 11. Play underway again now, and the Gamblers come out with the ball, and they'll start it on the power play. They'll really want to have a good showing here, down 3-0, seven minutes played in the first period. An early power play for the Gamblers, and they really need to make something happen. Well, their power play was very dangerous in the first two games of the series. It's gone quiet, and they really need to get something going on their man up again. Well, they throw it around on the outside. There's Grant Johnson now with a high shot. Nice save by Marty O'Neill, who read it well all the way. Rebound goes to Rod Tapp. Tyson Lias streaking down the right side, and he'll slow it up. And curl to the outside on the far boards for Tyson Lias. Remember, no shot clock when the team is shorthanded, as the Shamrocks are right now, so they'll try and kill as much time as they can. And now we see the Shamrock very dangerous four against five play uh, with Gary Gate and Tommy Marichuk, Dell Halliday, and Rick Brown. They bring the ball out high, force a double team. It looks like the Gamblers now are happy to not double team out top when Gary Gate has the ball and play him man to man, but they'll try and double team any other of the, of the other Shamrocks. So it looks like that's for their philosophy because the last two games, this four and five situation really got the Shamrocks on a roll. Well, just 40 seconds left in the man advantage now, and we talked last game, Chris, about how the Gamblers might want to start declining these penalties because really they've had nothing uh, going, and the uh, Shamrocks, in fact, have scored a lot of shorthanded goals, five, I believe, in the series so far. Well, four against five with the shot clock not running. It forces the team that does have the power play when they're defending to come out and do what you normally wouldn't do five on five, and that's double team to uh, get the ball back. It really opens up an awful lot of space underneath because the Shamrocks force you to double team out by the restraining line, and then the likes of Marichek and Pratt and Halliday can work their magic uh, with an awful lot of room to spare. Loose ball in the corner. The player's battling for it down there. Neil Doddridge scrapes it aside. Rob Watson, Bob Watson took a hack at it, but Doddridge came out with it anyways. They continue to try and kill this penalty interference there against Rod Tapp as he's knocked down from behind. Shut up, Kilgore! So now the Shamrocks home, still boy. with the ball. Only 14 seconds left in the uh, penalty to the Shamrocks. Tom Marichek with the ball. He's got Pratt out there with Tyson Lias, and now Gary Gate comes on the floor, replacing Doddridge. As you say, you see the Gamblers happy not to double team. I think they, after two or three games now, it's five on five anyway. They really aren't going to choose to press and give up those man down goals because those are emotional crushers. Well, Marichek with the ball. Team's back at full and even strength as Fred Jenner's back out on the floor. He joins the play. Gary Gate making moves. He'll play Gate tight out there, but he is the master of turning away from a single checker and making a move towards the goal. He's done it countless times. Well, Steve Toll has the ball now, and he sends it back. He takes a shot in front of the goal that's stopped easily by Marty O'Neill. Oh, a loose ball in front. Dangerous pass by O'Neill to Elias, but Elias with good hustle and a quick underhand pass now sends it to this side. And a young fan with a lacrosse stick in the crowd makes it pay as he gets a lucky souvenir. We've played nine and a half minutes of this first period. Game five of the Man Cup, Victoria Shamrocks leading three to nothing. The Gamblers really need to get something going. And Chris, oh, there's a hard shot deflected off the helmet of Rob DeZormo. Nice save by Marty O'Neill. Chris, the last 
25 goal of the last 27 goals in this series have been scored by the Shamrocks. It really seems impossible for the Gamblers. Can they come back at this point? Well, as we said, I think they can't get into the run and gun. They really got to slow down. Even though they're down three goals, they just got to come along, get a goal when they have an opportunity, and really try to play rock solid defense at the other end. I don't see any other way. If we get into the run and gun and they try to score with the Shamrocks, I think that's a bad, that's a bad strategy. It looks pretty dark for them right now, but lots of time left. Half a period almost, 9.56 to go here, and then, of course, the second and third, 50 minutes virtually, and so pushing and shoving now. The gambler's frustration may be starting to show. That's Bob Fisher holding on to the face mask of Tom Marichek, who's played so well in this series. The wrestling match so far, they're both trying to rip each other's helmet off. Marichek still wearing his hat. Fisher's comes off and hits the ground. Now they're torn apart, and I think we'll get a couple of roughing penalties here. Well, the gamblers still showing that they have some fight left in them. I would say they were a proud team of 12 first-year players in their lineup. Now they're missing Jason Luke, who was uh, an emotional motivator for them. Uh, Jason Luke, one of the fastest players in lacrosse, and showed some spark for them in the games one and two, and they're going to miss him tonight and try to get them going. So I think somebody else has to pick up the slack for the gamblers, and that may be the start of it. Well, while we've got a moment here. I'll tell you one of the stories that makes the Man Cup one of the special amateur sporting events in Canada. A big lacrosse fan in Victoria is a man called Tom Sampson. He and his family are members of the Sartlip Band, and they approached the team management of the Niagara Falls Gamblers, said they wanted to take the whole team home for a home-cooked meal. So yesterday it was supper for 30 at the Sampson household. A beautiful gesture by the Sampson family, and part of what makes all of this so special. Well, I think, too, uh, some of the Shamrock executives have had them out uh, salmon fishing, and they've enjoyed that as well. Well, here's Alton Davis now on a breakaway. He shoots, and it's played well by Bob Watson. The bounce shot stopped easily. Some of the gamblers haven't seen uh, the West Coast, and uh, the executive arranged for them to go out and do some Pacific salmon fishing and crab catching. I think they had a piece of that in their dressing room the other night, and I think they really enjoyed that. And, and uh, enjoyed the hospitality that the Victoria people showed them. Well, there's Darius Kilgore, who is injured tonight. Takes a hard shot, though. Oh, and the rebound. Good play by Darren Rising to push Andy Turner out of the way. He looked like he had an angle on that empty net, but he was pushed behind the goal by Darren Rising, who takes a tap on the helmet from his teammates as he goes to the bench. Well, Darren Rising came to life in game three with some physical play and showed some more of it there. Well, there were five-minute fighting penalties to the two combatants in that last altercation. So for the next almost three minutes, the teams will play at four a side. We've seen the Shamrocks be especially dangerous in this situation, too. With that extra room out there, players like Gate and Marichek can really open it up and make it run. Gamblers with the ball, eight and a half minutes to go in the first period. They're down three nothing, trying desperately to get on the board. Scott Ronson gets it in the middle for number 55, Dave LaRock. The rock turns, the Shamrock player goes down, ball goes back to the Shamrocks. Well, Tony Henderson just gets uh, called for interference on a back block, tried a little pick and roll. Here's Gary Gate all the way in and scores! Gary Gate picked up the loose ball. As soon as he got possession, the whistle signified play in. Gate had a man running interference for him, had a clear path to the goal. Well, the gambler's a little slow in transition there. The ball was on this side of the floor. They lost track of where the ball was. Gate took the ball. Long, long run. Here we're going to see it. The gambler's late getting to him. He shot the ball from well out that time before getting it on top of Watson, but he has, as we said, some of the best shooting skills in lacrosse in the world, and he showed them again. And Gary Gate has come out of the box like he was shot out of a cannon, and how the gamblers are going to stop that, I don't know, Scott. Well, that's 28 of the last 30 goals in the series to the Shamrocks. And it's looking more, we hate to say something like this early in the game, but it's looking a lot like they're going to have a bit of a party tonight. Warren Blackwell ready on goal as the announcement of the last goal is being read. Another good chance for the Shamrocks. Gary Gate, his third of the game. Unassisted, of course, as Gate took the dead ball and raced down the floor and simply put it in. He makes it look awful easy, Chris. Wow. 6'2", 210, 15, 20 pounds in that neighborhood, and all the skills can go any way. You can put the stick in either hand. And Chris Pratt now making moves through two players right in. Backhand shot. 
behind the back for Pratt. Nice moves there, but he shot it wide. There's a chance for Doddridge, a hard bullet of a shot stopped well by Bob Watson. Travis Kilgore takes the pass from Brother Rich, gets it over to the other brother, Darius Kilgore. His hard shot goes wide. Once again, we see the gamblers taking shots from outside. Chris Pratt takes a shot in the face. He's having some difficulty now. He's injured down on one knee in front of the Shamrock's goal. Now the whistle blows for the injury. Chris Pratt took a shot to the head, and he looks like he's hurt. Well, he just seemed to run into a, a double pick that was screen that was being set in there, but he ran into probably like two of the biggest guys on the floor, and Bruce Alexander and Travis Kilgore, and I think it was just inadvertent. I think somebody may have turned and maybe got a stick through his face mask there. As you see, he's got a bit of a gap in his face mask. Now, the face masks that they wear, of course, aren't supposed to have. Here you see him just coming into the, the pick there, and he just seems to run into Bruce Alexander's shoulder somehow, and... We don't see what got up underneath his mask, but Bruce Alexander, of course, the biggest man on the floor, goes about 255 pounds, and Chris Pratt, one of the smaller players on the floor, seemed to lose that battle. Well, you know, Chris, I think what might have happened there is the ball came up and stuck in that big gap in Chris Pratt's face mask. He then took a shoulder in the face, and the ball actually, I think, popped right into his mask, and that's what hurt him. We saw the ball drop out of uh, his facial area right after that, and I think the ball actually, when it stuck in his mask, and was shouldered right into his face. I think that's how he got hurt. Look, it's Gary Gate making a move against two men. He fakes the back behind the back shot and takes a high forehand. What a player Gary Gate is. He's really got it cranked up tonight. Gate to Brown right in front. Rick Brown to Halliday, and he couldn't handle the pass. Great playmaking by the Shamrocks as they're really firing that ball around. Gary Gate says, let's slow it down. We've got a new shot clock. We'll use this clock well. Now the Gamblers are going to get two minutes there. Once again, the Shamrocks, so powerful and quick on offense, and the Gamblers, Randy Mearns, had to hold, stop the cutter coming through from the weak side, and now the Shamrocks will be four on three. Well, Randy Mearns, a fiery, feisty kind of player. The penalty box, not a strange place to him. Well, he was over there uh, a couple of times in the in the series. Uh, but once again, we said that uh, Randy Mearns really has to unleash some of the scoring capabilities that he possesses and the gamblers would be better served if Randy started putting the ball in the net and spent a little bit less time in the penalty box. So with the penalty, the Shamrocks are now three aside. Lots of room out there. Gary Gate, Tyson Lias, and Neil Dodderidge, the three Shamrocks out there. Rich, in fact, the three Kilgore brothers on defense. That's Gary Gate with the ball. Whistle blows. The Shamrocks are going to retain possession. Our referee Rick Lum is uh, telling us to hold the ball there as he goes and straighten something's out at the penalty box. And maybe the 30-second shot clock they're talking about. It looks like the shot clock wasn't running. It's still sitting at 30, Scott. Well, a bit of a discussion now as we get this straightened out. Six oh one to go here in period number one. You're watching a Man Cup live on Shaw Cable and Rogers Cable from Memorial Arena in Victoria, BC. I'm Scott Earl with Chris Hall, Norm LaBus, and the entire Shaw Cable crew here at the old barn on Blanchard Street, and it's a rocking place once again, Chris. A packed house, over five thousand in the building again tonight. Well, standing room only two or three deep. It's Pack right back up to the Raptors, you're right. They've been waiting a long time, 14 years since there was a Man Cup. They've been coming out in these numbers all week. They've been having a great time enjoying themselves. The talk of the town is across right now, and here's decision game number one. Well, the coincidental minors have ended, so the team's now four runners aside. Gary Gate comes out there again. Del Halliday breaking for the goal, back behind the back shot. Nice save by Bob Watson, who read it all the way. Gamber sleeping again on the transition. They're a little slow getting back, and they've got to pick that pace up because the Shamrocks are rolling out of the far side, out of their own zone, and getting their two and one and three on two situations with ease. Well, Del Halliday there with the wraparound check attempt on Rich Kilgore. He ended up breaking his stick across Kilgore's helmet. 
Gilder wanted a penalty for high sticking, and he let referee Rick Lum know it as he went to the bench. Here's Marty Calder, a member of Canada's national wrestling team. He missed some of the Ontario League playoffs this year, traveling with the national wrestling team. He's knocked down now into a position he's been in before in his other sport. And just uh, tried to steer the ball with his glove hand, and of course, uh, you can't do that in this game, and it's a turnover as Shamrocks get the ball back. Gary Gate brings the ball down, hands it off to Marichek, back to Gate. Some interesting numbers on Gary Gate and uh, what his performance in this Man Cup has meant for his all-time Man Cup stats. We'll talk about that when we get a chance. Oh, a hard shot from Grant Pepper over there. Now Darren Rysick, oh, with the rebound, and he looked like he was going to pass and try a sharp angle shot that might have fooled Watson, but it bounced wide. Oh, and there's a low, hard bounce shot from Grant Pepper again. Now a long breakaway pass for Steve Toll. He has a little room, moves around. Gary Gate tried an underhand shot that was not very dangerous and went wide. Toll in front now, sharp angle shot. Not much chance there as Marty O'Neill had the angle cut down. And I think the size of the Shamrocks was a factor there. Uh, Steve Toll came down and had to face Gary Gate. And as we said, Gary Gate... Big and strong, and the smaller Gamber players are really finding it tough now to get around the Shamrocks. Well, a problem we've seen for the Gamblers throughout this series is their inability to stay out of the penalty box. And now Dave Smith, playing in his first game in this Man Cup, adds to their misery by taking a two-minute penalty of his own. Well, wait for the announcer. There may be too many men on the floor, but the Gamblers were having uh, such trouble uh, getting out of the box and transition on defense. They may have tried to get out a little too quickly that time. Well, it's a bench minor being served by Dave Smith, so I cast aspersions upon him, perhaps unnecessarily. My apologies to Dave. I'm sure he's glad to be in the game tonight. Well, a behind-the-back pass from Maracek to Pepper. This shot is stopped, but Darren Rodgick takes the rebound and fires it in. Well, uh, Darren Rizek playing his first game on the power play on the crease. He really came to life, as we said, in game three. Has been playing well. Coach Nermal Dillon has now made an adjustment, put Rizek on the power play, and rewarded him for his play so far in the series. And he answers that by being alert. As you see him, the shot for a shot, Rizek sitting on the crease. Here come the ball pops right out to him. Nobody in sight. Just a low shot that gets under goalie Bob Watson. So it's 5 nothing, looking more and more grim for the Gamblers all the time. LaRock right in for the Gamblers. Nice save with the stick hand by O'Neill. And I think Fred Jenner, as uh, the shot was just missed there, Fred Jenner with a high stick after the play, and he's going to go to the box in two minutes. So I'll have the... Gamblers are going to get anything down, going, uh, Scott, with 3.26 to go in the first period. Uh, this has got to be the timing. Sooner or later, they have to get something happening. Here we see the, the shot. And there's a penalty on the play. We're going to see that here. Fred Jenner's That's gone a, off to the box again. Comes in. Marty makes a good save, and there you see it. Fred Jenner after the play in the crease and just cross-checks him off of their shoulders into the helmet, and that's uh, clearly a two-minute penalty, Scott. 16-34. Rob DeZormo with the ball now. The Shamrocks, and as strange as it sounds, are in that dangerous position where they find themselves down by a man, mostly because of this guy, Gary Gate. And we'll talk about Gate for a minute. He'll probably slow things down here. Remember, no shot clock while the team is shorthanded. Gary Gate started this year's Man Cup in 30th spot all time. With his three, uh, four points so far tonight here in the first period, he's now 15th all time. He's moved up 15 spots just in this Man Cup alone in all-time scoring. Now with 49 goals, 31 assists, 80 points, 15th on the all-time list. He just passed John Servi, who played in the Man Cup in 1961 and 1967. So Gary Gate, his legend grows. And you see the respect the gamblers hold for him as they don't bother to double-team him in that four-against-three situation. There is Kilgore with a hard shot that hits Marty O'Neill square in the face mask, and he is down and he is not moving. Well, that caught Marty high, uh, just underneath the mask and the shoulder of the pad, it looked like, and what a rocket shot by Darius Kilgore. Now, DeZormo goes over to talk to Darius Kilgore because he thinks maybe that Darius Kilgore was throwing the ball at Marty's head. Uh, I don't know about that. 
Scott. It just looked like a rock hard shot from outside from Kilgore. And, but of course, the Marty O'Neill uh, had uh, been the one that at the beginning of the season, at the beginning of the series, said that potentially the Rocks could sweep. So maybe Darius Kilgore is. Here we see it. Uh, here you see it. Uh, Kilgore was looking to go on the top right corner with it and caught Marty up high on the uh, shoulder pads under the mask. We don't know if it got him right in the mask. We couldn't quite tell, but Marty's up now and seems to be okay. Yeah, it was good to see him taking his own mask off there. He laid absolutely motionless for a good five or ten seconds after that shot hit him. What a rocket, and it hit him square in the mask. But he's having to drink water, and he looks pretty clear-eyed down there, does Marty O'Neill. So we know now that Marty can take a punch. Well, and the padding these goalies wear is very sophisticated. Uh, when you have to stop that very hard rubber ball coming at you at 100 miles an hour uh, without the padding they wear, <laughs> that ball hurts. Some once in a while it gets up underneath your pads or just the sheer force of that lacrosse ball hitting your face mask really stuns you. And Darius Kilgore, of course, one of the hardest shots in lacrosse. I already think, Scott, that uh, DeZormo, uh, when he went over to talk with Kilgore after that, was just making sure that Darius knew that if that shot was intended for anywhere else but the goal that the Shamrocks would answer that in a hurry. Although it's it's almost hard to believe that that was intended to be a, a head shot. It was a very hard shot and uh, the gamblers desperately need a goal and uh, you have to believe that the motivation there was to score and nothing else. Uh, Darius Kilgore and Rob DeZormo are both going to get two minutes now at least over there in the box and they're continuing the discussion as to where each person thought that shot was headed. So a busy first period for officials Rick Lum and Don Brocky. A busy first period for goalie Bob Watson of the Niagara Falls Gamblers as he's allowed five goals already. Partly due in fact to uh, Number 22 out there for the Shamrocks and a lot of his friends in green. They've really dominated this first period. Now face off, we talked about uh, the Shamrocks uh, at the beginning of this season. When they put this team together. They were in the Mad Cup last year. They had maybe a couple of holes to fill and they certainly done that uh, because this team has strength in all dimensions of the game, Scott. The chance in front. A good shot there by Grant Johnston. It's Kilgore out there now. Kilgore shoots a hard bullet again. And Marty O'Neill, a brave man, standing up in front of that one as well. It went just wide. O'Neill helping out in back of the goal. And good work as Neil Doddridge comes out with the ball. Doddridge, a nice bounce pass to Tyson Lias. He couldn't control it, though, and he has to take it into the corner. Elias turning, the Shamrocks shorthanded. It's four on three out there now. Four runners for the Gamblers against three for the Shamrocks. But there's Gary Gate with the ball. Gate makes a move around two players, heads right to the goal, shoots, scores! Gary Gate! What else can you say? They say, Scott, as we said, in the first uh, 18 minutes of the period, they wouldn't go out and double team Gary uh, when they were man up, five, four against five. And Gary Gates shows you why right there. He finally draws the double team out by the restraining line and just goes right by both of them. Gets himself in all alone on Bob Watson. One, two fakes. Gets Watson moving to his left and puts the ball back in the right behind his uh, knee on the right-hand side. And as I said, Scott Boy, you can check him, try to check him with one player. You can try to check him with two and sometimes three, but it really just doesn't seem to matter. Gary just goes by them all. breakaway players in all alone time and time again for the the Irish and they really are pulling out all the weapons Jenner's Rizek they can show you what talent they have how deep they are on the lineup and I don't know how the answers are going to come for the gamblers here here's Fred and there's nobody within 20 yards of him as he cruises on a Watson has plenty of time little uh, stick fake and continues on down through Watson's leg. Well, 
Well, you hear the fans counting off the goals. They did that Friday night here in game four. We've got fans dancing in the aisles. The crowd is really going here tonight. Isaac with the ball in front now gets it from Marichak. It gets away from him and bounces to Bruce Alexander. Well, Marty O'Neill with the pass there to Fred Jenner gets an assist for the second straight game. He got one last game as well. Into the last minute of the first period now. Once again, and, and sadly for the gamblers, we've used this analogy before, but for the third or fourth time in this series, the Shamrocks are successful converting the touchdown. 7 0 with 28 seconds left in the first period. The penalty over now for the Shamrocks. And they will now enjoy a power play, which will carry on into the next period unless they can get possession here. I'm sure the Shamrocks will be more than happy to let the final 12 seconds run out. Up 7 0 in the first period. Paul Day with the ball, he takes a shot, and it, I think that hit the crossbar, or Marty O'Neill made a high save. It did stay out nonetheless, and there's the buzzer to end the first period of play, and Chris, we're running out of superlatives at 7-0. Well, the Shamrock's really on a roll. They solved the puzzles of the gamblers after uh, three, six, eight periods of lacrosse, and since that time, it's just been an absolute steamroll of effort by the Shamrocks. The Gamblers have absolutely nothing to answer back with. Uh, two goals last game, uh, four periods of lacrosse, five periods of lacrosse now for the Gamblers with two goals, and almost unheard of in the box lacrosse and certainly in the Man Cup. Well, the shot's on goal in the first period. The Shamrocks 23 and the Gamblers 12, almost a two-to-one advantage, and that has a familiar ring throughout the whole series to it, Chris. Well, first two games of the series, Bob Watson uh, stood on his head, keep the Shamrocks at bay when they were outshot, something like 60 to 32, two to one. Um, you, you know you just can't keep asking your goaltender to, to do that. Uh, you can't ask any goaltender to do that. Uh, certainly not Bob Watson, certainly not Ryan Kells. Uh, uh, I don't care who you have in net, uh, you just can't withstand that kind of pressure. So I think that's really broken down the gamblers and uh, I think the, the little bit of the injuries they have, the injury to Luke has really hurt them and I already think that it looks like they don't have many tricks left in their bag to pull out. Uh, they try to slow the game down, we saw that. Trying to play uh, against Gary Gate, they won't even double team him out top now. Uh, Bonnie forced to double team him out the top and he runs over both players and scores a goal. So. I don't know. It's it's really got to be frustrating for Coach Terry Sanderson and the Gamblers because you look down in your lineup. You said you look in your dressing room. You look somewhere to get something going for you, and yet you look down the other end of the floor, and and boy, it's that's that's one huge powerful team that you're trying to get something going against. Well, the numbers get stranger and stranger. Of the last 33 goals in the series, 31 of them have been scored by the Shamrocks, and as ridiculous as that sounds, in the first eight periods of the series, the first two games and the first two periods of game three the gamblers really played well they won a game they almost won game one and after that second period of game three everything changed and they have been completely outclassed ever since what happens to make such a drastic change well i think in the first two games of the series uh, neither team really don't know each other yet so they're a little bit uh, tentative and trying to figure each other out what weapons they have what strengths and weaknesses they have and so it's that little bit of a chess game back and forth but to, once the shamrocks figured out that they were bigger stronger and had more weapons it's been all over since then well, our in-between periods host has been Norm LaBus all week. Norm's doing a great job down at the southeast corner, and he's got some more right now. Let's go down to Norm. Thank you, Scott. We're here with Jeff Rudd, columnist with the Times Columnist. And, Jeff, today's paper, stick a fork in the gamblers. Well, I brought along a fork, and I didn't, I didn't know if that was for you to eat your words, or maybe we should just about put the prod in the gamblers and pronounce them dead. Yeah, I don't think I'll be eating my words, Norm. I think I'll have to stick to the Memorial Arena hot dogs today because uh, it looks as if the, the gamblers are done 7 nothing after one period. I mean, this Shamrocks team has just put on another awesome display here today. Now, in, in all your years covering sport, do you often see, see a team get so dominant so subtly? No, this team is really scary. I mean, if you get analyze the offensive capability they have, uh, they can just turn it on in a dime and just overpower teams and completely overwhelm them and uh, 
they're so scary because they can cruise along and not look all that good and all of a sudden break out and just take over a game with any number of players. Gary Gate obviously took over this period, but they've got seven or eight guys that can just fill the net up, and that's what makes it tough for a team like Niagara Falls. Yeah, with their depth and, and the momentum they have rolling now, it's it's really something to watch, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I feel sorry for Niagara Falls. I mean, they basically, I think, feel they're playing an all-star team, and they've got a good young team, but nobody can match up with this kind of talent. This was a great team before you added Gate and Marichek, who may be two of the top players in the world right now. Definitely Gary Gate is, and Marichek, I think, has shown that he's right up at the same level nearly as Gate. So what we're getting to see here is a real treat for any sports fan and for a lacrosse fan in particular. So. Let's, let's talk about Gary Gate in particular. I know you were watching part of the game last night with Steve Nash, and Steve was marveling at some of the moves Gary was making. Well, I think there's certain things that sort of cut across sports, certain uh, shoulder fakes, head fakes, uh, things that players do with their bodies that sort of transcend all sports. And I think Steve was just admiring some of the unbelievable moves that Gary was making. I mean, uh, I think as a point guard, there's some certain similarities there between uh, what, a, what a player like Gary does and what Steve does on the basketball floor. They both control the play, and uh, they both can, ma can make some pretty wonderful things happen out there. So I think it's a mutual admiration sort of thing going on. Now, not only was Steve admiring uh, Gary, but we've got 5,500 or so people here. The crowds have just been spectacular this week, and Victoria sometimes maybe doesn't get a, a, a fair reputation for supporting amateur athletics. I think, you know, this goes to show, uh, and I'm writing this in tomorrow's paper, so you got the scoop first, but uh, this goes to show that if you give them something worth watching, they'll come out. I mean, that's all. Uh, I think the softball legends proved that. The UVic Vikes basketball team proved that. All those teams won national championships, and if you give them something worth watching, people will roll out, especially for this kind of a ticket price where it's not so overwhelming to take your family to a game. I mean, in a lot of ways, this is a much better deal than, than a major league sports ticket where you're paying 40 or 50 or 60 bucks to see probably athletes that are no better than this, really. Yeah, Jeff Rudd from the Times calling us. Certainly, it's Major League Athletics. We're enjoying it tonight. We talked about Gary Gate. Well, right now, we're going to take a look at a tape that talks about offensive skills in lacrosse. I'm Ben Smiller with the tip of the week. This week, we're going to talk about individual offense or beating your man. And Dennis Quigley, assistant coach of the Coquitlam Adnex, is going to help us with that. Dennis, can you talk to us a little bit about, with lacrosse being such a team sport, how important is individual offense to contributing to the team? Well, if, if I can get around my opponent unassisted, then that opens up a lot of options for my teammates as well. Or I, can, I could go straight to goal if I beat my opponent, or I, and beating my opponent they might have to come and help somebody. I have to leave their man to come and help uh, to check me because I've beaten the person. So um, that opens up an, a passing lane for me to outlet the ball to one of my teammates because his man is now king on me. So it opens up the game and it, and it creates havoc for the defense. If, if somebody is skilled enough to get around people and it's a skill that has to be practiced quite a bit. And I think it's not practiced as much as it should be. Okay, so maybe you can tell us a little bit about some of the techniques, like what kind of plays are used to, to beat the man or to be offensively, you know, effective? Well, uh, footwork is extremely important and uh, incorporates some body uh, fakes or feints. Uh, we refer to them as shifts or, or dodges sometimes and sometimes it's just a matter of directional changes very quickly, um, using quick, quick feet and uh, head fakes uh, to, you know, to fool the defense. We want to get them moving and then we try and and change our direction on them quickly before they can counter. So it happens very quickly, and uh, it's a really important part of the game. So maybe you can tell us about some of the different, what do you call some of the moves? Uh, we refer to a jab step. Uh, we refer to stutter steps, uh, um, weak side uh, a move, uh, strong side move, and uh, a weak side move to, back to a roll to your inside position. So.
Thanks for joining us. That's our tip of the week. We'll see you next week. back on the arena floor and let me preface the following by saying the Times Colonist Sport Department has done an exemplary job covering both the Man Cup and all major sporting events this year but on the front cover of the paper today a life section reporter was attempting to chronicle why it is that the crowds have returned in such big numbers here at Memorial Arena. The writer claims that uh, lacrosse has enjoyed such a huge increase since 94 when the team changed its name back to the Shamrocks and hired someone to update the music. Well, I thought it was the butter tart recipe in the concession stands. Chris and Scott, what do you think? Well, we've had some of the hot dogs too, Norm, so the concession stands are getting a lot of press here, and we're glad to be a part of that because uh, we had some dogs delivered to us last night. They were maybe uh, one of the best parts of that game. Well, Chris, we're not going to talk about the score a whole lot. It's 7 nothing, and it's become a regular thing the way the Shamrocks have played the last couple of games or so. But an interesting story with the Shamrocks is that the team has a real local flavor. A lot of local boys on the team. Well, I think uh, when you when you see a team uh, of this much power and strength, that a lot of people sometimes would think that uh, you you bought <laughs> the team. Uh, but this uh, team is really has uh, nothing but almost locals on it. Uh, they added some players last year. Uh, where they went back to the Man Cup and were swept in four straight, although the games were already close, so they knew they had to make some small adjustments, but they also knew that uh, those small adjustments uh, probably rested in some Victoria players that they had to get back who were playing in other places. Uh, so the executive really went out and uh, found uh, uh, the gold mine of Gary Gate, of course, and encouraging him to come back and added uh, Dell Halliday and uh, Tommy Marichek, uh, all Victoria kids, and then uh, went and uh, recruited Rod Tapp and Neil Doddridge who uh, weren't from Victoria, and really the only other player in the Victoria lineup here who didn't uh, grow up playing his minor lacrosse in Vancouver Island or Victoria is uh, Kyson Lias. So of the 25 players on the Shamrocks roster, 22 of them uh, grew up and played together in, in Victoria and, and uh, Nanaimo, and I really think that uh, shows of the chemistry. They were used to playing, they've been used to playing with each other. They've gone away and played in other places. They've gone on to scholarships in the United States. Uh, of course, the Gate Brothers under the fame of Syracuse with Tommy Marichek, uh, Del Halliday at Loyola, uh, Bruce Alexander now on a field lacrosse scholarship back there. Uh, but it's a real treat for these players to come back in the summer, see each other again, and play with the players that they've played together since they've been growing up. So uh, I, I think the Victoria fans too and uh, the minor lacrosse associations of Victoria are going through a growth stage here because they can see that Victoria is producing some pretty awesome lacrosse players uh, both in the field game and in the box game and it's a treat for these people the fans to come back and and see the fruits of the rewards of their their efforts and coaching and developing minor programs to see this team on the floor and what a team it is Scott. Well you talked about the infusion of new talent but Chris you also said between periods when we were off the air that you think a lot of the credit has to go to the lessons learned from the four game sweep in last year's Man Cup when the Shamrocks came up on the wrong end but they actually did play a pretty good series it appears the lessons were well learned. I think they were missing a couple of uh, right-handed goal scorers. Uh, they knew that. Uh, special teams so important in a Man Cup series, any championship playoff series, and certainly in this game alone, special teams are very important. So they went out and got Del Halliday and Tommy Marichek on the right-hand side. It can really put the ball in the net for them. They got the two Pepper brothers to come back out. Uh, twin brothers, the same age as the Gate uh, twins, both identical sets of twins, went to the same high school at Claremont of the growing up playing lacrosse together and know each other like they know the back of their hands. Uh, and added the face-off man and Rod Tapp and the experience of Neil Doddridge, who, if things go the way they're going tonight, will be the first player in the history of box lacrosse to win six men cups in a row. Well, the Shamrocks are rolling like they have not rolled all season. And doubly amazing, Chris, is the fact that they're playing against the best team from Eastern Canada, these gamblers, and uh, really showing them who the number one team is this year. 
Well, you know, the Six Nations, uh, of course, have won the Cup the last three years. Some of the players here are from the Six Nations, but you've really got a lot of young players on the Gamblers who uh, played in St. Catharines, went through Minto Cup championships. It's their first time here in the Minto Cup and uh, looking to try and find the Kilgore brothers, Randy Mearns and uh, Jason Luke of the world, uh, Steve Cole, to try and give them some experience. But I really think the depth and strength and overall prowess of the Shamrocks has really worn them down. Well, 12 rookies on the Gamblers roster, so they definitely are gaining a lot of experience from this. You have to think we'll see these guys back down the road, but for now, we're going to see what they hold in the character department as they're down 7 nothing a minute into the second period. If they don't win tonight, it's going to be over, and it's looking like that's the case. They're taking some early shots again from the Shamrocks. Rising with that rebound there. And uh, we'll find out what kind of uh, maturity these young players on the Gamblers have. Well, a very difficult position for them all to be in. But, you know, Coach Terry Sanderson has really kept these guys together for a long time. He, we talked to him uh, over the course of the last couple of days, and he says, well, I don't really know what I can do. I've, I've got a couple things we can try and work on, but, gee, uh, I look out on the floor and I see the big, strong Shamrocks uh, with good goaltending and great defense and all the scoring they have. He says it's going to be a large task for my boys to, to come and really try and keep if we can crawl back in the series or even at some point make a game of it. Well, that penalty that the Gamblers had late in the first period that carried over now into the second period has just ended. So the team's back at full and even strength. 18 minutes and 15 seconds to go in this second period. And if you've been watching this game or if you're just joining us, it's a one-sided score, but keep watching. These are some of the best lacrosse players in the world, and they're really putting on a show tonight. Players like Marty O'Neill making a great reflex save right there to keep the shutout intact. That was really a marvelous play by Kilgore. Kilgore was knocked down by Bruce Alexander, and by one hand, it passed the ball in front of the net, and O'Neill had to come up with a great save. A little fire being shown by the gamblers. They don't appear ready to lie down yet. They've got possession again now. Teams at full and even strength. Five runners aside. Two and a half minutes into the second period. We're in Memorial Arena. You're watching. Oh, they score! A harmless looking shot from outside from Grant Johnson. Marty O'Neill won't like that as the goose egg's gone. It's 7-1. Well, Grant Johnson happy with that shot. They finally get the monkey off their back. 7-0 with a goal early in the third period. And now they look up at the scoreboard as they walk back and they're starting to think, well, can we or can we? Because certainly until they... Here we'll see the replay. Just an outside shot. Comes across on Halliday. Steps back. Lines himself up. And a little bit of screen on Marty O'Neill. Looks like he gets by him. Henderson and LaRock get assists on the first goal for the Gamblers. There's Johnson again now. His shot goes right up into the crowd and some unsuspecting fans walking along the aisleway there don't know how close they came to getting an injury here tonight. One thing we notice is the Gamblers are really being forced to play high with the shamrock size and strength now keeping them well away from the net. Shot by Rising, stopped there by Bob Watson. The ball goes into the far corner. A whistle now, and possession goes back to the Shamrocks again. There's a shot from Tommy Marichek out front. That goes high over the net. In front for Blackwell, it goes off his stick. Marichek gets the loose ball on the far side. Marichek making moves in front, trying to cut towards the goal. Backhand pass to Grant Hamilton. And that must have hit the side of the net. What a nice passing play. Hamilton couldn't quite convert. He gets it again now, right in front of the goal for Marichek. Alone, takes a shot, played well. Bob Watson stayed right with him. Grant Hamilton again now takes it. New shot clock for the Shamrocks, so they'll slow it up, bring it back outside again. Darren Rysig leaves the floor for Gary Gate. Four goals and one assist in the first period. Gate in on five of the seven Shamrock goals. But the Gamblers have scored the first goal of this second period. A little spark for them, and it would be nice to see them make some kind of a game of this, Chris. Lots of time left. Gary Gate in front, making moves. Oh, and he almost got another one in there as he shot it just wide on the far side. Rod Tapp now took a, taking a desperation shot as the shot clock expires. 16.01 now left in the second period. 7-1 Shamrocks. Here come the Gamblers. 
I noticed the Shamrock doctor was probably addressing him, and I haven't seen Chris Pratt this period, uh, and I don't see him down on the bench, Scott, so uh, perhaps uh, he's suffering a little more than we thought after that shot he took in the first period when the ball went between his masks. Well, here's Randy Mearns now making moves. Steve Toll's open in the slot. He takes a pass and takes a hard shot. Saved off the shin pad of Marty O'Neill. Wine to the ref, Kilgore! And I think we've got a penalty call. The Shamrocks are going to take a penalty. Another power play for the Gamblers. Well, the Gamblers look like they certainly aren't about to give it up, as we said, on the last game of a, a Man Cup series or when there's, we get a decision game. The team that's about to give the cup up uh, is it doesn't go down very easy. And uh, the Shamrocks got that big early lead at 7 nothing, And then it's hard for the Shamrocks to maintain their momentum and going in. You say, well, is it over? We're almost there. 40 minutes to go. And sometimes you just get into a little bit of a lull. And I think any little lull like that, the gamblers are going to try and take advantage of. And they got the little spark, uh, a glimmer of hope with the uh, Tolls goal. And now they get a power play. Well, Mike Simpson's going to serve that penalty that went to Marty O'Neill for slashing. Bit of a hack by O'Neill, detected by the officials. Loose ball in front. Marty O'Neill has it in his equipment. And he gets it over for Rob DeZormo. They call him X, and he flies down the left wing, handing the ball off to Tyson Elias, number 13. Kind of ironic, isn't it, how Tyson Elias wearing the lucky shamrock on the front and the unlucky 13 on his back. Darius Kilgore with a breakaway and a hard shot stopped by Marty O'Neill. Marty O'Neill not uh, scared of the ball after taking that hard shot to the head in the first period. He's still standing very tall in there. Well, Darius with another good opportunity. He's one of, we said at the outset of the broadcast, he's got to start scoring for them. Well, the Kilgore brothers all out on the floor now. That's Darius with the ball. He passes it across to Grant Johnson. That shot goes wide, and the Shamrocks start out. Neil Doddridge with the ball. He'll wait for some teammates to make line changes. Tyson Elias with it now back for Doddridge. Well, Steve Pinnell there came out of the box, and then we're looking back. He was... Marichek going to break away, shorthanded. Oh, and he tries the fancy behind the back bounce shot. What a move by Marichek. And Bob Watson did a good job to stay with that. You can never tell what these guys are going to do. Marichek and Gates showing some amazing stuff out there. Well, I just was about to say that Steve Pinnell was looking around for Gary Gate because he got caught coming out of the box. He had to go and check uh, the far side, and then he had to leave Gary Gate alone. He was worried about it. In the meantime, Tommy Marichek came out the back gate and uh, was in all alone. So, as we said, boy, you look around, and there's one, two, and three more of them coming at you. Steve Cole out high now and takes a shot. The whistle blew before the shot was taken. And I think we're going to have offsetting minors now. Darius Kilgore very upset with Darren Rising. Well, Darius Kilgore had the ball, of course. Rising slashed him on the penalty. Uh, power play as the ball was moving down. And Darius Kilgore is really taking exception now to the treatment that he's getting. But, of course, the Shamrocks know that Darius is the key to the gamblers. And Darius has been in the penalty box probably far too much than he needs to be uh, for the gamblers. Uh, they don't need him sitting over there. As we said, the superstars are going to get a little more attention. They get a little extra whack when they pass the ball or shoot the ball. And if you retaliate, well, you not doing your team a lot of good as you go in there. You really got to eat those ones and, and put yourself up two men instead of one rather than going to the box as a soft. And Darius hasn't finished uh, talking to Darren over there and Darius saying, well, if you're standing there, I'm going to give you a whack and we'll both go off. Yeah, they're really jawing at each other down there and they're not that far apart in the penalty box. You can see even the, uh, the penalty timekeeper now trying to get in between the, the players in the bench. Now the original minor to the Shamrocks has just expired. That was the minor that went to Marty O'Neill. Mike Simpson back on the floor joining the play. Team's four aside now. Garrison be pointing out the clock, telling Riser, look at the score. Why am I taking this pounding? Well, here's a breakaway for Steve Toll now as he goes in all alone, shoots and scores. Some nice moves by Steve Toll, who had nobody near him. He faked out Marty O'Neill, and there's two consecutive goals for the Gamblers and a bit of a spark. It's seven to two. Well, good effort by Steve Paul. He's one of their grinders. He's worked hard all series. One of their better players. Here we see him wide open on the breakaway pass from the turnover. Comes in, and sweeps across in front of Marty, picks up his fake, gets him up in the air with the right hand shoulder, really gets him out of position, and a beautiful fake by Steve Paul to get Marty O'Neill on his heels. 
and puts it by him on the short side. Well, a bit of a reversal in this period. Chris is the gambler's lead in this period, 7-3 in shots so far. And as we said, boy, you get a 7-0 lead and you think it's over and you come out and it's probably a difficult period to play for the Shamrocks and the gamblers get that goal and they look up at the scoreboard and maybe we've got a chance. Now they've got another goal and 7-2 and... Maybe we can creep back in it, is what they're saying right now. Well, 7-2 looks a lot better than 7-0, which it was after one period. Shamrock's trying the hidden ball trick. Now it goes to Dell Halliday on the far side for Marichek. Out top to Gary Gate. He has trouble with it, but controls the ball. Being checked closely by Steve Finnell. There's a chance now for Marichek in front. He fakes a shot, twists and turns in front of the goal. Now heading for the deep slot. Almost goes down, but manages to keep his balance. Gets the ball to Halliday. Halliday muscling in against Randy Mearns, and the shot clock expires before they could get that shot away. Steve Finnell still playing good defense on Gary Gate. It's a tall order to ask one player to check him. Finnell's been there the whole series. It's a tough task. He's been working at it. He hasn't lost his enthusiasm for it. He did a good job there. Well, that's Tony Henderson with the ball on the right wing, battling Alton Davis. A nice defense there by Alton Davis to get that ball. Alton Davis, a 14-year veteran, and you've got a history with him, Chris. Well, Alton Davis played for me as a rookie, uh, actually a junior pickup in the 1983-man cup. Uh, he got a little taste of it there, and he's been around since then, but he's had to wait an awfully long time. He's just been a great player, a stalwart for the Shamrocks, really a committed player and a, a coach's dream to have around. He'll do anything you want him to do, and I really feel happy that uh, Alton Davis is getting another chance to sip from the cup. Well, there's another uh, expiration of the shot clock for the Shamrocks. I don't think they mind that too much with a five-goal lead. They like seeing this clock tick down closer and closer to the Man Cup Championship. But there's a long way before that happens now. It's a 7-2 to score. The Gamblers have scored the only two goals here of this second period. And five players aside now as everybody's out of the penalty box. Rich Kilgore making moves up at the top. Derek Graham. Takes the ball, heads for the middle. Darren Rising's on him. Graham shot not that much on it, and it was deflected up over the glass. Another souvenir for a lucky fan. Well, once again, Scott, we see the defense of the Shamrocks really forcing the gamblers to sweep outside, and even outside the face-off circles, which is really a gravy for Marty O'Neill, goalie. They really got to try and get underneath, and here they're trying now on the short side, but Shamrocks deny them once again. Marty Calder now making moves, heading for the net. A little soft bouncer in front, stopped easily by Marty O'Neill. You know, we were talking about Alton Davis. He's a real fan favorite here. In his 12 previous Man Cup games before tonight, he had earned four points. Uh, in fact, before the, in, before the last two games, in his last two games now, he's had five points. So now a total of nine points in uh, 14 Man Cup games for Alton Davis. Oh, and there's a nice pass in front. Darren Rizek with the quick stick low. Nice save by Bob Watson again. And Watson may be the player of the series for the Gamblers. And here's a chance for Marichek. He tries the behind the head shot. Nice save again as Watson gets a toe on it. And uh, it sounds funny to say that. With, we've seen a couple of blowouts, 14 goals in game three and 17 in game four for the Shamrocks. But really, I think Bob Watson is the player of the series for the Gamblers. Well, he certainly made games one and two very close. And was really the reason why they were able to win game two of the series. Rich Kilgore right in, and he scores! Right through the legs of Marty O'Neill. A terrific move by Rich Kilgore, and the kind of spark they've been looking for from Rich that they haven't had for a couple of games. Well, I'm not mistaken, Scott, I think that's Rich Kilgore's first goal in the series. It was a beautiful one coming in. We're going to see a replay of it, and here you see the skills of Rich Kilgore with a great overhand fake, sweeps it down, stick in front of him, and then backhands it behind O'Neill. Unassisted goal to Rich Kilgore at 9.39 of the first period. 10.21 to go now. 7-3 for the Shamrocks. So maybe we're going to have a game yet, Chris, as it's 7-3 now. And Gary Gate comes in. Oh, and he tries a behind-the-back shot. There's a penalty coming up now to the Gamblers holding the call. Referee Rick Lum makes the call. And another power play coming up for the Shamrocks. Well, Gary Gate just got loose in there. And, of course... Gamblers forced to take a penalty. Randy Mearns just had to put the grab on him as he went underneath or he would have been in all alone on uh, Watson. Well, the Gamblers showing some signs of life here, Scott. 
uh, up, I think, some signs of class and saying they could have rolled over after that first period 7 nothing. but they're saying, well, we're going to come out and we're just going to keep at it and keep at it and keep at it, and maybe something will turn around for us. And so far in this period, that's what's been happening. Here Let's we take a look at that look. goal again. Yeah. There you see the great overhand fake. Kilgore just sweeps the stick across his body, starts dragging Marty O'Neill across the cage, and that's what you want to try to do is get the goalie moving in the net and then puts it between his legs. Once you get the goalie moving, then there's really opens up some opportunities, and Kilgore shows why he's one of the best players in the game today. Well, there's a timeout down on the floor right now. Timeout was called by the Shamrock. The Shamrocks call that timeout. Uh, Coach Nermal Dillon's <laughs> looking at, having a look at what's happening, realizing his team's a little bit flat now. They seem to be sitting back and kind of trying to just wait the period out here. And uh, that's a very dangerous thing to do. It gets yourself out of the momentum. And uh, get, for a coach, you just think, I don't want to go back yeah, to the way we were playing in game one or two where nobody was really doing things. Two minutes for well, Randy Mearns takes that penalty again, and Randy Mearns, we mentioned already tonight, has spent a lot of time in the penalty box over there, and another untimely penalty with his team on a roll. Three consecutive goals for the Gamblers. They haven't scored as many as two in a row in just about two games now. In fact, almost six full periods since the Gamblers have scored two consecutive goals. They've got three here in the third to make it a 7-3 game as we now reach exactly the midway point of the second period. And, Chris, you were right. That was Rich Kilgore's first goal of the series to go with four assists in his three games. Of course, he missed games one and two with an injury. Oh, a nice pass in front for Dell Halliday, and what a save by Bob Watson. He didn't know where it was, but luckily for him, the ball was under him. Bob Watson trying to hold his team in it as they're on a roll here. They've scored three straight, and it's seven to three. The pace of the game really picking up, Chris. Nice to see this after the blowout that the first period was. Well, the gamblers are gaining some confidence, a little more comfort now, saying maybe we can, maybe we can, maybe we can. Good stop by Watson on a chance by Halliday, and if they can weather this power play and then maybe get a good opportunity at the other end and make it 7-4, it's really going to help their confidence. Grant Pepper across to Marichek. He takes a hard shot that bounces off the end boards and off the back of the net. Marty Calder with it there. Up for Steve Cole. He's two-on-one with Grant Johnson, who shoots, and a nice stick save by Marty O'Neill. And Cole already playing a great game for the Gamma so far. He says, I'm not done here yet, and I'm going to do whatever I can to keep us alive in the series. Well, here comes Gary Gate. Four goals and an assist in the first period. Nothing for the Shamrocks so far here in the second. Rick Brown back for Gate outside. He winds up, fakes a shot, right in, scores! Gary oh. Gate just dancing through the slot. He's got his ballet shoes on tonight. That's goal number five for number 22. And what a... Marvelous fake. It just stands up the top. He whip fakes the stick and whips it across his body. We're going to see a replay and watch this for stick skills. Here comes Gary. He looks like he's got to go through two defenders. He fakes like he's going to the shooter, whip the stick across to the front. The players buy it at the top, and he walks right through the middle of the zone and all wide open. And what a marvelous fake by Gary Gates. Well, Grant Pepper gets possession after the draw, and Gary Gate stems the tide as the Gamblers have had scored three straight. Gate makes it eight to three now, and this game's really opened up. Both teams getting a lot of chances now. Gary. Isaac and Brown get assists on that goal from Gary Gate, his fifth of the game, a power play goal. He has a shorthanded goal and three even strength goals. So Gary Gate pulling out all his tricks tonight. And showing why he's considered with his brother the best two lacrosse players in the world today, Scott. And what a treat for these fans to see those skills. Dave LaRocco out there. Now Dave Bremer's lost his stick. It's broken and laying on the floor. Bremner without a stick. A disadvantage here for the Shamrocks. This is just like a power play. And they pull their goalie, the Gamblers pull their goalie because the Shamrocks are going to get a penalty here. And Bremner's stick wasn't broken. It was just far enough away from him that he didn't want to leave his check. He's got his stick back now, and it seems fine. Uh, a little bit of pushing and shoving there, and Marty O'Neill gets a little bit of a cross check in there, stays in his crease, however, because he doesn't want to be coming out of his crease to do that, or he'll be ending up in the penalty box. 
we were going to talk about it earlier when Alton Davis was out there, Scott, and we were talking about Alton's play, but uh, Alton's one of the few players left in the game uh, that's still using the wood stick. We see a couple of them out there right now. Rob DeZormo uh, looks like he's using a wood stick, and Dave Bremner using wood sticks. Uh, Bremner, DeZormo, and Alton Davis, all known as checkers in the game, and of course the, the wood stick uh, really provides a, a heavier little chop, uh, uh, I guess more than anything else. <laughs> To make a long story short, it hurts more when you get hit with a wood stick than, a, than it does when you get hit with a plastic and aluminum stick. So uh, you'll see some of the big checkers still uh, using the wood stick in the game. Tap and Darius Kilgore in there for the faceoff. And on the whistle, the possession goes back to the Gamblers. 7.51 left in the second period. Shamrocks took a penalty there, so it's a power play for the Gamblers. 8-3, to three, and it's nice to see the Gamblers making a game of this as we've just passed the midway point of the game. 7.44 left in the second period. Rich Kilgore with the ball. Oh, a pass in front now. As the Gamblers throw it around, Rich Kilgore gets that loose ball. Outside, he gets it behind the net. Oh, and they tried to bounce it off the back of Marty O'Neill there. Clever shot by Darius Kilgore. Tried to catch Marty O'Neill sleeping. Here's Rod Tapp with the ball. He's got Lias with him, but they're both well checked. So Tapp brings it back out, gets it across to Lias. Now the Gamblers power play, which was very, very effective in uh, games one and two, has really disappeared in the last three games, Scott. And I really think they've got to get some uh, something happening with that. So they showed two or three different sets and, and really had the Shamrocks running around. But since game two, their power play has not been effective at all. Well, there's Fred Jenner, number 19, with the ball. That's a bit of a... Aaron pass from uh, Jenner as it goes way up into the crowd. So possession back to the Gamblers again. They find themselves on the power play for another 50 seconds. You see the Gamblers see if they show us a different set. No, it's a traditional set with a point man, two shooters, and two crease men. And they haven't showed some of their other sets that they showed earlier in the season so far tonight. Rich Kilgore outside, a hard shot off the foot of Derek Graham. That's got to hurt. There's no padding down there. Steve Toll to Graham. Graham back outside for Kilgore. He can shoot. He does. He scores. No, no, they say the play will continue now. That must have been a crossbar. Well, I hit right under the crossbar next to the post, and we saw the net move, and it did look like it went in, but it went rocketing right back down the floor, so I think it was dead off the post. Yeah, it must have been. I could have sworn I saw it spring off the top of the net, but apparently not. Both referees in good position to see that. They both immediately made the call, so clearly that one went off the post. What a chance for the Gamblers. That would have made it 8-4, to four, and this would have been a much more interesting game, although it's become that now. As the domination for the Shamrocks seems to have subsided to this point. Gary Gate with a chance there. It's saved by Bob Watson trying to keep his team in it. Well, we talked at the end of the first period about what kind of character the Gamblers would show after going down 7-0 with this young and uh, relatively inexperienced team when you compare them with the team in green. Oh, and so far... Oh, the hidden ball trick. <laughs> and there's a trick that, of course... Uh, Coach Terry Sanderson has taught his players, and Terry Sanderson, when he was playing, uh, used to be very clever with it. They come out of the box, they exchange the balls. It looks like they've exchanged it. They haven't. Steve Cole keeps the ball and keeps it hidden in his stick. Marty O'Neill on the far side. The Shamrocks all <laughs> fell for that one, and they all bought that the ball was on the far side. Here you see Marty O'Neill. The ball's out top of here, and see Steve Cole puts it in. Only Marty O'Neill thinks the ball is out top on the left-hand side, as do all the Shamrocks. And just a lack of communication there, and players not focusing to watch it when that happens. So uh, a real confidence play by the Gamblers there, and a big goal with 8-4, Scott. Well, I'll tell you what, Chris, they fooled me, too. We got the best seats in the house, and I had no idea what was going on there. Only old coaches can still see those things, right? <laughs> well, what a play. That was... Uh... That was something we haven't seen. We've seen that tried a few times in the Man Cup so far, but that's the first successful usage of it, and boy, was it ever successful. That ball was in the back of the net and rolling out before Marty O'Neill ever knew there had been a shot taken. That's a lack of concentration. The players will try it and try it from time to time, and then every once in a while it succeeds for you. Oh, and there's Grant Johnson in, and he scores. That's right off the top of the net that time, barely under the crossbar. And the Gamblers have really come back in this game. It's 8-4. to four. What great spirit. What great effort by the Gamblers. They're saying not yet, gentlemen, not quite yet. They've scored five goals this period. The biggest output we've seen 
so far in the series by the Gamblers in that short of time. Here we see Grant Johnson just sneaks underneath the Tommy Marichek. Marichek tries for the over-the-shoulder check. Johnson strong with his stick. Keeps it. Fake on O'Neill. Fake again and then catches him. Well, Travis Kilgore had a great chance there while the replay was on. And that went just over the net as well as Kilgore had a breakaway. Fennell and Calder get assists on that goal, so it's eight to four now. This turning into quite a contest. Sorry, it's eight to five now. Now we got ourselves a bit of a lacrosse game, but the Gamblers can just stay with it. We're 12 to go here in the second period. Just a three-goal game now as the Gamblers have outscored the Shamrocks four to one here in the second period. And we didn't see any way that this could happen, Chris, but it shows you what an unpredictable game this lacrosse is. The fact that there's so many goals scored relative to other sports and uh, the fact that there's a full 60 minutes to be played, still 24 minutes left in this game. This is exciting and it continues to get more and more interesting as we go. The Gamblers are not giving up and you know, the last team to come back from a 3-1 deficit in the Man Cup were the Vancouver Berards. In 1964, they beat the Brooklyn Redmen from Ontario in the Whidbey Arena. Our official statistician, the WLA statistician, uh, Stan Shillington, was the assistant manager of the Berards that year. Stan tonight, uh, the official statistician for his 99th Man Cup game. And the way the Gamblers are playing now, we may see his 100th game tomorrow night because the Gamblers have scored four goals here in the second period, and suddenly they've come to life like the Phoenix rising from the ashes. Well, a display, too, of what, how big a role that the mental focus plays in the game, Scott. We talked about it at the end of the start of the second period. The Shamrocks come out, and they go a 7-0 lead. Boy, we can sit back and relax, and uh, the Gamblers are proving to them in a hurry that you can't do that in a Man Cup series because momentum shifts almost like a tennis match when you watch it, the mental focus, and you see it, how they're playing when they lose their mental concentration, and that's where the Shamrocks are right now. Well, that pass uh, was intended. And here's a chance in front. Oh, and the ball gets away out of the stick of Marty Calder. He knocked the net off its moorings. And we see now Chris Pratt back on the floor. So maybe he's uh, gotten a couple of stitches uh, from the doctor if he had a cut or something. But he's back out there uh, with 2.49 to go. But uh, missed the better part of uh, this period. We didn't see him since the start. But now with uh, 2.49 to go, he seems back and ready to play. A little comic relief there. It's that last pass from the Shamrocks was intended for Bruce Alexander. It bounced up into the timekeeper's bench on the far side in the penalty box area. And the four gentlemen manning that booth all had to turtle when that pass bounced right in at a sharp angle into the penalty bench area. Those four gentlemen have pretty good reflexes over there. You can tell they've been here before. Well, a bounce shot bounces high in the, into the stands up on the walkway. A fan in a yellow t-shirt and a gray ball hat made a fine one-handed stab, perhaps saving the life of the fan just behind it. Well, you mentioned to the statistician scores in the penalty box over there. I know Bert Waring his crew. Uh, Bert's been doing uh, this uh, as long as I've known. He's been doing it since I was five or six years old and I can remember along with my uh, late father of course the whole crew used to be here doing the statistics for the hockey games and the lacrosse games so they're a well experienced crew over there Scott. Well, we've seen both of these officials in several games of this series, especially Rick Lum. I think this is at least the third game he's officiated, and really a great job. We haven't mentioned the referees a lot in, this, in the whole series, and that's a good sign that they're doing their job very well. I've seen and not heard. Uh, it's great when you're talking about uh, officials. Official, the referees really haven't played a big part, and that's great. Uh, you always want that. The, the officiating's been quiet, well executed. Uh, they sorted out any rough stuff that needed to be sorted out in a hurry. They've given penalties to players uh, at times when things could get ugly or start to get ugly, and I really think they've managed to, I won't say control, but literally manage the game so that we've gotten to watch lacrosse, and uh, that's what we're here for, Scott. And what lacrosse we're seeing, if you're just joining us, this is game five of the Man Cup. It's eight to five now, and the Gamblers have just taken a penalty, so they'll be shorthanded. Gary Gate right in on goal, making moves. Oh, and he tries the behind the back shot as Gate, very patient. He waited and waited and waited. Finally got a shot, and it just went wide. Tried to get Bob Watson to move, and Bob Watson said, not tonight, not this time. Grant Pepper now with room, moving in. He tries the behind the head shot. That was well over the net. Outlet pass now for Grant Johnson. He has two goals in the game tonight, both of them here in the second period for the Gamblers. 1.52 to go here in the period, and the ball was knocked away 
to Rod Tapp. Gary Gates showing his defensive skills. He can play at the other end of the floor, too, with a nice little wraparound check. One thirty-five left in the period. Now Gary Gate up top on the power play. Gets the pass over for Grant Pepper. Pepper fakes the pass to Gate, makes a move right into the middle, and nice job by Randy Mearns to knock the ball out of his stick. Watson gets the ball up on the right side for Johnston. Pratt checking him. Alton Davis also back, and Doddridge now comes back, so Johnston has to wait for help. Randy Mearns, Randy, uh, Rich Kilgore is out there. Johnston with the ball now, gets it ahead for Rich Kilgore. He takes the bounce pass. 39 seconds left in the penalty to the Gamblers. No shot clock, remember, while they're shorthanded. Bob Fisher with the ball. But Flacane tells us there's one minute left to go in the second period of play, and what a period it's been for the Gamblers as they lead this period 4-1. to one. It's 8-5 to five overall, and after a 7-0 score in the first period, these fans not as noisy as they were in the first. Chris Pratt now with the ball racing down the right wing. He takes that Aaron pass. The pass now for Tyson Elias, not quite there. Andy Turner intercepts for the Gamblers. Paul Day down the right side. Darius Kilgore is with him up front. And timeout, Gamblers coach Terry Sanderson. Here's a time when I'd like to talk to my players. That's a push oh. shoving down the corner, Scott. Rob DeZormo and can't see which gambler it is, but they're now milling around. Well, we've got Bremner. Bremner down in there, pushing and shoving, gloves in the face. Derek Graham also matched up with a Shamrock player down there. It looks like Darius Kilgore and Rob DeZormo exchanging head butts at this time. They've each got a hold of each other's face mask. Well, now it looks like cooler heads might prevail as most of the twosomes have broken up. We hear the arena music, bad boys, bad boys playing, and that's what we're getting, a little bit of bad behavior right now. <laughs> well, DeZormo is still uh, feisty down there, but everything under control now, and I think we're going to get some minor penalties out of that scuffle. Well, you know, Scott, so these players really don't want to be fighting because uh, you, you don't want to be thrown out of a Man Cup game uh, when potentially it's a decision game. Uh, uh, they're here to play lacrosse, and, and uh, it, it's... It's something that, that comes along so rarely. Uh, you, you really want to be out there being a part of the game for the entire game. Uh, you don't want to be thrown out of the game. So I think uh, we'll probably see a lot more pushing and shoving than you will breaking out of the fights, uh, especially in the last 10 minutes of the game. Uh, you want to be around uh, for the final moment. Well, a bit of time here now with 24 seconds left in the second period as they sort out the penalties on the far side. Now that it's 8-5, uh, to five, Chris, and we've had such a good period for the Gamblers, it makes it pertinent now to perhaps talk about what happens in case we reach overtime. We haven't seen overtime yet in the series, but tell us what happens in case that comes about. Well, we're tired at the end of regulation time. The teams will go and take a rest in the dressing rooms and then come out and we'll play 10 minutes of lacrosse, and uh, anything goes there in terms of uh, goal scoring. It's not sudden victory, so they play a, a full 10 minutes. And then if the score is uh, still tied at the end of that, um, then they'll go back to their dressing rooms for a full intermission and then come out and play a 20-minute period, uh, which then is sudden victory. Now we see down here, I didn't quite see what's happening, Scott, that Darius Kilgore seems to be going to the dressing room with 24 seconds left. I don't know if he's been ejected or they just said with 24 seconds left that uh, Darius and DeZormo maybe should head to the dressing room, so we'll have to wait and see because certainly if Darius Kilgore has been thrown out, that would be the second time he's been thrown out in this series, and now that the Gamblers have climbed back to 8-5, certainly they don't want to lose the man that can put the ball in the net for me, them at the rate that Darius Kilgore can. Well, Darius Kilgore has left the floor, you're right, Chris, but Rob DeZormo is still over in the penalty box there, so you have to wonder if Kilgore has been thrown out or maybe he's got an equipment problem or an injury of some kind to deal with because the two-minute penalty now being served by Dave Smith. And 
No, I think that was Dave Smith. We got to see it has gone over to serve Darius Kilgore's penalty, but there's no announcement uh, here as to why Darius has gone to the dressing room. So uh, maybe he was cut or something. He has to go off for repairs, but there's been no announcement that he's either received more or a 10 minute misconduct or game misconduct. So we have to assume at this point that he's still in the game, Scott. Well, we were waiting for the time of the penalty to be announced, which tells us that all the penalties have been announced. That that was never done. So you wonder if there is a little confusion there, but clearly the. Uh, Gamblers find themselves with five players on the floor against four for the Shamrocks. There's a nice check by Tyson Lias, who's knocked down and gives it away, though, to Rich Kilgore. Kilgore moves in and takes a hard shot, and he did that because there was time running out in the period. They had a three-on-one there. A few more seconds for the Gamblers. They might have had a lot better chance to score, but Rich Kilgore had to take a shot as the clock expired. So well, we'll sort out these penalty situations. The score after two periods, the Shamrocks eight, the visiting... Gamblers five and what a period for the gamblers. Well fantastic comeback by Niagara Falls there. Well the shots 13 uh, shots evenly matched that period but the gamblers outscoring the Shamrocks five to one to climb back in the game. Uh, Got to be a big emotional boost for Niagara Falls. Going into the dressing room, Coach Sanderson says, well, look, we can score. Where have we been the last couple of games? But we're awake now, and we've got 20 minutes to go here to try and get ourselves. So they will play desperate lacrosse this period, Scott. Absolute desperate lacrosse because if they lose, they're gone. Uh, the Shamrocks, of course, now after really having a poor period there, and it was a poor period, since they've lost their focus, kind of waiting for it to happen. And if you wait for things to happen, they're likely to go in the other direction. And that's what happened uh, in that period with the uh, Gamblers coming out with five goals, which I said we haven't seen since, oh, well, we haven't seen them score that many goals in that short a period in the series. And uh, certainly it was a long drought for them, but uh, they took advantage of their opportunities there. And the Shamrocks sat back on the heels for almost the whole period, with the exception of Gary Gate. And we said at the outset, what the Shamrocks can't do is stand around and watch Gary Gate and Tom Marichek uh, because the, the rest of them have to go to the net and take their opportunity to score goals. That period, they didn't do it. Well, if you're a lacrosse fan, it was fun standing around watching Gary Gate and Tom Marichek <laughs> in that first period. But it really, it's nice to see the Gamblers come back and make a game of this. We noticed the Gamblers were late returning to the floor after the first intermission. So obviously, uh, Terry Sanderson had uh, some extra things to say. Whatever it was, it seems to have worked. Well, they're playing spirited lacrosse, and they got themselves back in the ball game. Uh, and, and I said, now, now they know that if they lose uh, at, at, at this at the end of the, at the end of this period, if they're if they're still on the wrong end of the score, the series is over. So you will see some very desperate uh, lacrosse, and they will play with their hearts and their heads and their souls, everything they've got to come and try and win this game. Well, uh, it's, as I say, uh, Chris, uh, it's nice to see the Gamblers come back and make a game of this uh, eight to five after two periods now. Norm LaBus down at the southeast corner has got a guest with him, Bill Hutton. Let's go down to Norm. Thank you, Scott. As you mentioned, we're here with Bill Hutton, who is the chairman of the board with the Canadian Lacrosse Association. Bill, you've been here for the whole week. You've seen all the games. Uh, your, your views on the series? Oh, great series. Absolutely great. Phenomenal lacrosse. The skill level of this series is, is, is probably the greatest skill level I've seen in, in the last 10 years. Interesting to note also that we're getting a real ebb and flow. Of course, the Gamblers back here now, but the Shamrocks just became so dud so so dominant so suddenly. H have you seen that before? Well, uh, last year I, when I saw the the Shamrocks uh, back east, you know there were only one or two goals out of it, and I figured they told me they were going to come back, and I knew they would. They're a, they're a team with a lot of depth and a lot of character, and of course the skill level speaks for itself. Now, as you say, they are maybe a player or two away. One player that stands out when we mention that, of course, is Gary Gate. He's just great for the sport. Yeah, absolutely. Gary Gate has done more for the sport than any other player, as, as in my memory. He's brought the, the skill level of the game up two or three notches. He's probably set the example of, uh, of a type of game, fast break, up and down the floor. You look at his shooting skills. Others are, are, are mimicking those skills. And it's changed the game right around. No longer do we have the, the uh, grab and hold type thing. It's a quick shots, fast releases, over the shoulders. Uh, just absolutely phenomenal. So Gary Gate, one big story of this uh, national final. Of course, the crowds as well. I mean, we've just done tremendous here in Victoria. How does this compare with other man cups? Oh, it, there's no doubt in my mind this has to rate at the top in terms of attendance, in terms of 
of a community getting behind the team, cheering for them, and it's positive. Like the people up there, they're cheering for their team, and they're 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 hunt behind them. Uh, I can't tell you how far. I, uh, people have already said behind me. They're saying we're gonna get our tickets for next year. Got to get them for next year. This is great. We love it. We love it. It's got to be great for the sport of lacrosse, then, doesn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. And this is happening across the country, but but this here really probably epitomizes it for me. This is the this is the pinnacle right here. Okay, Bill Hutton from the Canadian Lacrosse Association. He says it's happening here in Victoria like it's happening across the country. Tonight's game, the Gamblers are back in it. Defense is part of the reason why the uh, Niagara Falls team is back. We're going to take a look now at a tape talking about defensive skills in lacrosse. John Bensmiller with the tip of the week. This week we're going to talk about individual defense and Dennis Quigley, assistant coach of the Coquitlam Adnax, is here to talk to us about it. Dennis, describe for us the importance of team defense and how individual defense contributes to the team. Well, it's extremely important that the uh, defender keeps the uh, offensive player out of the, what we call a prime scoring area and give him maybe really low percentage shots is, uh, is quite uh, uh, permissible but uh, not the real high percentage shots we want to uh, get in good body position by getting playing overplaying their stick and getting a good uh, low profile a strong uh, biomechanical stance where the knees are bent uh, legs are wide apart the uh, weight on the on the balls of the feet um, I mentioned the term overplaying the stick, so we line up on the opponent's stick and basically force him to go to his weak side and deny him those good quality shots at the top, which is the most high percentage shot at the top of the goal area. So uh, by getting in good body position, we deny that, and by getting in front of the stick, they can't shoot through us. We can block it with our stick, or, or, or the shooter would have to be aware that he might take a penalty if he, if he hits me in, in the follow-through. So. Um, body positions, everything, and we're trying to uh, downplay the violent cross check that uh, we, we used to see so much of, and, and uh, by putting the stick on the person and using to steer him out of that prime scoring area to a low percentage shot is, is basically what we're after, and we use words like containment, and we have a 30 second clock, so they have to shoot within 30 seconds, so we're using the clock as, as an extra helper in that, in that regard, so. If we're playing tough individual defense, then we're, we're going to make it very difficult for the offense to get a good quality shot, and that's what it's all about. Okay, thanks for joining us. That's our tip of the week. We'll see you next week. Niagara Falls gamblers were slow out of their dressing room after period one, and something they said obviously paid off. First time in five periods, the gamblers outscoring the Rocks. 5-1 that period. Perhaps we've got a way to go before the Man Cup is actually hoisted. Chris and Scott, uh, what do you think? Well, Norm, it's a much more exciting game. We're glad to see the uh, good showing by the gamblers there in the second period. And Chris, we're just reminiscing about your playing days as a uh, Victoria Shamrock, and you were recruited not as a lacrosse player, but sort of as an all-sports kind of guy. Was that a common practice that back then, and w can we see that at all anymore? Well, I think you still can see a little bit of it. Uh, I was recruited by my high school basketball coach, actually, who was the head coach of the Shamrocks at the time, and uh, I'd played a little bit of rugby and football and baseball, uh, so I was kind of an all-around athlete at the time. And uh, I'd always been uh, had a stick around at some point because my father had been involved with the Shamrocks since their inception in 1950. So there was always one hanging around the basement that I used to cart across to the schoolyard once in a while. But 
Um, it, it was a, a difficult transition at first. My friends, I know, used to laugh at me, uh, come and watch me play. And I remember one time chasing a ball uh, came loose in our own defensive end, and I kind of tried to scoop it up all the way down the, <laughs> the floor. And finally ran out of room at the south end here and face planted into the end boards. And they always uh, continue to remind me about that episode. But uh, over the years, I finally uh, came around and learned the skills of the game. And I think you can still do it uh, a little bit. I think you really have to. Um, there's some players that we talk to that are big, strong uh, athletes that uh, play a little bit of basketball and rugby. Uh, and certainly, if you've got a great defender in basketball uh, that's learned to play defense uh, without their hands, uh, we come out and uh, put a stick in their hands. And, and basketball uh, defense is very similar to lacrosse defense with the picks and rolls and the zones and the screens. Uh, so they really already understand uh, those concepts and they're really quite thrilled when you say uh, well and then besides that we'll put a stick in your hand and you can actually cross check and hit somebody with it to uh, really detain them from going to the net so I think yeah you still can uh, we get the odd player and uh, feel the cross it still comes out I know the Shamrocks uh, at times have recruited some players that have uh, had limited uh, lacrosse experience but really became accomplished players and over the years you really start developing you stick with it um, and go out with the, with the guys and throw the ball around that uh, and you're practicing three, four nights a week that over the course of one or two seasons and maybe three or four seasons, you can stick with it. You really start to develop some offensive skills too. And it's always a thrill if uh, <laughs> when you finally uh, get that first goal, and I know your teammates are always very supportive of that. And you, they get the ball back and they sign it for you. And that's really the start and you go from there. Well, that started you on a long career where you played for nine years with the Shamrocks, won a Man Cup, then came back to coach uh, for, was it six years? Uh, seven years. Seven years Shamrocks. winning another Man Cup as a coach. Uh, mm -hmm. Did you ever think that that would be the end result uh, when you went out to your first practice with the Shamrocks? Well, certainly not, although, you know, I watched every uh, lacrosse and hockey game in this arena from the time I was born. My mother used to bring me to this rink. Uh, I was born in 1950 when the facility was built, and my father was a statistician uh, for the uh, hockey and lacrosse, and uh, so I never really got to play in this rink until I was 22 years old, but I watched many games. I remember uh, the national anthem playing uh, the first time I suited up for the Shamrocks and standing at center, and and really it was it was a, 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 an exhilarating feeling. But for, for once in my 22 years, for some strange reason, I was down on the floor instead of up in the stands having some popcorn, and I was sort of unsure as to what I was going to do. <laughs> Well, that was 1983, the last time the Shamrocks uh, won the Man Cup. You were the head coach that year. Who were the key players on your team in 83? Well, we had uh, the magical Kevin Alexander, of course, uh, who was a true wizard with his stick. Uh, Still to this day, uh, I think uh, Kevin Alexander could probably stand on the power play and uh, do some magical things that would really turn the heads of the, of the people in the stands. Uh, he still strings sticks for many of the top lacrosse players in the world, actually ship the sticks to him, have him string them and ship them back to them. Uh, that's how good he is with a stick. Uh, we also had John Crowther. Uh, who was a rookie uh, at the time and really a fantastic player, a superstar uh, quality player. Um, I remember, of course, the likes of uh, Alton Davis, who is uh, getting those memories returned uh, tonight. And uh, we had the uh, goaltenders, Mac Maud and uh, Scott Marshall. So those are some of the players that uh, I remember. And of course, many more. We had a great supporting cast. It was uh, a lot of fun. And in 20 minutes, uh, we may some of the, see some of that excitement again. Well, that's one of the great stories of this Man Cup is Alton Davis winning it with you guys in 1983 in his rookie season, now having to wait 14 years for it to come around again. He's not the only one who's been waiting that long, though. There's a lot of fans in this crowd here tonight waiting for a bit of a party at the end of the game, but we don't know for sure we're going to see that now. The Gamblers have just had their first good period in a long time, and it was a great period for them, outscoring the Shamrocks 5-1. to one. Well, they're going to come out, uh, and I think we'll see desperate lacrosse. We'll see... Uh, any, anything the gamblers can do to get themselves alive in this series to say they know they've been here it's been a long couple of weeks for them and they don't want to go home yet you never want to go home without the cup and they will do everything they possibly have to win this lacrosse game and the Shamrocks really have to get re-motivated again and I know Coach Nermal Dillon has been in there saying look we, we can't they're not going to hand it to us we can't drift through this period and expect to come out winners if we're going to win uh, we're going to win this game. Let's go out and do what we did in the last game and in the certainly in the first period and get to that back to that style of cross. Let's not stop. Let's stop watching the Gators and the Marichuk and let's get out and get a goal yourself. And that'll be something for you to remember. And then the team will remember that it's victory forever. Well, and it's the first time in a couple of games Normal Dillon has had to have a talk like that with his team. We'll see if it worked with 20 minutes to go. Gary Gabriel's in and scores! 15 seconds into the period. Gary Gabriel. 
Shamrocks a four-goal lead, and what a start for Gary Gate. Believe it or not, Chris, that's two hat-tricks for Gary Gate tonight. Six goals. What a player. Uh, he just pulled it out of the uh, gate. Got a great pass. Accelerated. You see him he accelerates there on the play. Power, strength, speed blows by him, and Gary says, mm, this is going to be our night right of the first period, and I'm going to start it off right here at 9-5. Seconds later, only 30 seconds into the period, Rick Brown he makes the Shamrocks hit double figures. It's 10 to 5. 30 seconds, two faceoffs, one by Rod Tappy. He's been dominant all series. A quick pass to Gate for the first goal, and now a second one to Rick Brown. And Rick Brown, former MVP in this league, who we haven't seen a lot of scoring from, but he says, I'm going to take my turn and show you what skills I have, and just blows one by watching on the strong side. Well, this is like a recurring nightmare for the gamblers. And right off the bat, Tap wins a faceoff again, and the gamblers are going to have to weather another storm. Pratt and Dodderidge get assists on that goal by Rick Brown. So two goals in the first 30 seconds. Hear the fans counting down the Shamrock goals now, and they're up to 10 already, 10 to 5, and that's got to be a bit of a heartbreaker for the gamblers that they had they had muscled their way back to a three-goal deficit. Now they find themselves down by five. We played just over a minute of the third period, and the crowd was quiet in that second period while the gamblers scored their five goals. But now the crowd's woken up again, and they're hungry for a victory. And it's when this crowd gets going, it's a great uplifting experience for the Shamrocks as well. Coincidental minors in effect, and now there's another penalty coming up in front of the goal. A holding call against the gamblers, and the Shamrocks are going to get a power play, and that's the last thing the gamblers needed. Now uh, Gary Gate once again takes the ball, goes going to the net every time now. Every time Gary gets the ball, he's going to go to the cage and really force the gamblers there to take a penalty. Mern's going to the penalty box again. Steve Finnell was trying to put the check on uh, Gate Mern's. Here you see. The replay of it, Fennell comes down to check, but Mearns has really got a hold on Gate. And normally we see Steve Fennell checking him, but during the change, Randy Mearns had to pick him up, and Gate just ran over top of Randy at a big size differential there. Well, that's number 36, Randy Mearns, his third penalty of the night. He's really having trouble staying out of the penalty box. So here come the Shamrocks on the power play. The ever-present number 22, Gary Gate, is out there. Marichek gives him the ball on the other side for Rick Brown. Shoot, scores! Rick Brown gets his second in a row. 11 to 5, and the Shamrocks once again take a stranglehold on this game. And this has got to be sweet stuff for Rick Brown because Rick Brown has been put in a lot of years with the Shamrocks, and we'll see Rick here. The pass just goes over to Rick Brown again, and Rick Brown, as I said, a former MVP in this league. He knows how to score. He knows what to do with the ball when he gets it, and two goals in a row for Rick Brown, and he'll be just thrilled with that. Rick Brown, a longtime Shamrock player, way when he went through those years when the Shamrocks didn't have a strong team, has put a lot of hours and effort, and I know he'll be thrilled with those two efforts. Gary Gate gets another assist on that goal by Rick Brown. Oh, and another chance for Grant Hamilton, and he rings it off the crossbar. The fans count up to 11 now, celebrating this great third period so far for the Shamrocks. Three unanswered goals. And almost now an insurmountable task. The Gamblers haven't scored that many goals in a series game yet, so they've Here's got Hamilton long in come. front again. Nice save with the stick by Bob Watson and the rebound is set just wide. Well, Rick Brown scoring those two goals in a row and the ball gets away from the Shamrocks. It'll turn over to the Gamblers. Rick Brown just scoring those two goals. Obviously a player with a lot of offensive talent, but you know, the Shamrocks seem to me to be a team that's so deep that Rick Brown doesn't have to score to be effective, but you can see he can still do it. 
Well, Rick Brown's been playing defensive role uh, for much of the part of the season, but shows that he can still play on the power play, and that's where the Shamrocks are so dangerous. And what do you do? And one of your defensive players, uh, your power play is not working, and one of the players that's usually playing on the man down the short man or, or playing a defensive role for you then comes out and scores two quick goals. I think the gambler's got to be looking around. Pratt in front oh. scores! Nice pass from Fred Jenner. That's four quick goals in the first three minutes and 21 seconds of this period. It's 12 to 5, and there's a large fat lady at one end of the rink warming up her tonsils. She may sing very soon. Well, Chris Pratt just catches Grant Johnson sleeping. The ball comes down from the top. Ball's top right on the goaltender here. There you see Chris Pratt sneaking in behind Johnson, who just falls asleep. He backdoors him and gets a great pass and puts it behind Watson. Well, Elias and Jenner getting the assist on that goal to Chris Pratt. Four quick goals for the Shamrocks to start this period. And the fans are loving it. They get the count to 12 this time. Here comes Grant Pepper trying to make it even worse. I haven't seen Darius Kilger out this period yet. Either Steve, we didn't hear an announcement when he went off at the end of the second period there, but we don't see him on the bench and we haven't seen him on the floor yet. You have to wonder if Darius Kilgore was injured. He was a uh, potential scratch for tonight's game. He did manage to get himself into the game, but maybe he is injured now. We didn't hear a penalty call beyond the minor that we know he was issued there, and so we have to assume there's some sort of injury to Darius Kilgore, and he seems like uh, he may not be back. And they could use his help. The gambler's good. They find themselves down by seven, but make it six now as Scott Ronson gets a loose ball at the side of the goal. And as Marty O'Neill fell, he fired it in the top of the open net. So it's 12 to six. And Chris, you just never know. Well, you can score in bunches of this game, almost like basketball. A team can get a 20-point lead. The next minute you look up and the other team's winning. So Scott Ronson, we'll see in the replay here, just comes under. He fakes low for the underhand and gets Marty O'Neill going down. You will see it coming underneath there. The ball goes loose, Scott picks it up, fakes low, then goes up over top of O'Neill, goes down on his back. Well, Steve Toll gets an assist on that play, and that's his third point of the night. A nice night for Steve Toll so far. Toll's been a factor all series long for the Gamblers and still working hard for them. Well, the most goals we've seen in a game so far in this year's Man Cup, there's a shot from Grant Johnson, rebound to Fisher, and he scores! It bounced right on the goal line. Marty O'Neill tried to get a glove on it, but it bounced right through him. Shamrock's headed in the other direction on that after Marty O'Neill made the first save, and he just went straight to the net and got his own rebound and put the ball in. Here you see it gets rushed in, gets his own rebound. All alone on Marty O'Neill. Great hustle. Third point of the game for Grant Johnson as he assists on the goal by Bob Fisher. Two quick ones for the Gamblers to make it 12-7. And you're right, Chris. So many goals can be scored in such a short time in this game. This is really not over yet. 12-7, but still, remember, 14-44 to go in this game. Don't you dare go anywhere. You're watching Game 5 of the Man Cup live from Victoria's Memorial Arena on Shaw and Rogers Cable. We're glad you're with us. Stick around. If the Shamrocks can nurse this five-goal lead to the end of the period, they'll have a big celebration as they'll be Man Cup champions. But the Gamblers still showing a lot of heart, and they may yet have something to say about that. Now the ball goes back to the Gamblers. Actually, the Shamrocks will retain possession. The, one of the officials pointed towards the Shamrock goal. It looked like it might have been a turnover, but the Shamrocks still with the ball. Darren Rising working against Dave Smith over there. Rising twisting and turning, gets it for Marichek in front to Blackwell. High shot up over the net. Nice passing. Good ball movement by the Shamrocks. 
I started to say the most goals we've seen in the in the uh, series so far, Chris, is 21 in game three where the Shamrocks won 14 to seven. We've got 19 goals tonight, still 14 minutes left to go. So this may and probably will be the highest scoring game we've seen in the Man Cup this year. Of course, the gamblers forced now to press and go to the net, and so the game is going to be wide open from here on in. Long shot down to Marty O'Neill. He easily handles that and gives it off to Darren Rizig, who sends it up on the left for Tyson Lias. Rizig heads to the bench. Rod Tapp comes out to replace him. Dell Halliday with the ball in front. Oh, and Lias didn't know the pass was coming. Rick Brown there to cover. Gary Gate on the far side, heads for the net. Oh, and a good defensive play there by Steve Toll to check him from behind. Gary Gate powers by one step fake and then just rambled by his check to the net and a good check to save that. One of Gary Gate's real weapons is for a big man, he has an amazingly quick first step. He'll be standing stock still and suddenly he'll be gone and around the defender. And it's amazing for a man as large as he is to be able to do that so quickly. Nice save there by Marty O'Neill, holds on to the ball and rolls it out to Tyson Lias, who will start out for the Shamrocks, who lead 12 to 7 here. 12 minutes and 50 seconds left in the game. That much time stands between the Victoria Shamrocks and their first Man Cup in 14 years. Grant Pepper on the far side. There's a hard shot that's barely stopped by Bob Watson. His just got that with the bottom edge of his stick, manage, managing to keep it out of the net. Grant Pepper, one of the two sets of twins, the Gates and the Pepper twins, both identical sets of twins that went to high school here at Claremont. Grant, however, the only Pepper in the game tonight. Greg, a scratch just before the game. Paul Day with a shot in front. Stuck in the equipment of Marty O'Neill, who gives it to Chris Pratt. Good to see Chris Pratt out there after missing some time. Tom Marichek now with the ball. Marichek to Grant Hamilton. Ryzik goes to the net, takes the pass now in the corner. Simpson's out in front. Warren Blackwell behind the net. For Marichek, oh, behind the back shot. A nice save by Bob Watson. Randy Mearns comes out with the ball for the Gamblers. Jimerson is with him. DeZormo and Ryzik are back for the Shamrocks. Mearns holds it up as he didn't have the numbers. Gives the ball to Steve Toll and goes to the bench in favor of Tony Henderson. Now there's a steal by Darren Rizek. Good defense there by Rizek to steal the ball. 11-20 left in the third period. Rick Brown, two goals here in the third period for the Shamrocks, showing his experience and talent tonight when it's needed the most. Tyson Lyle scores! Another harmless shot, and Bob Watson shrugging. He must have been screened on that one. I think so, although Tyson Elias has a wicked outside shot. He's got a rig deep pocket in his stick, and sometimes when Tyson shoots the ball from outside, the goalie will think it's going high, and because the pocket's so deep in Tyson's stick, it just dives on the goaltender, and a powerful outside shot by Tyson. Here you see him still sets up. Pass goes to Tyson. He's well outside, but he's shooting over top of three people there, and Watson was probably partially screened on and looked like it, but I say, Tyson sticks so in such a deep pocket in it as the ball dives on the goaltender and it's difficult to stop. Well, you can see Watson shrugging there and he's frustrated as you can tell. What a third period for Rick Brown. That's his third point. 13-7 now. 20 goals total in this game. And Gary Gate now with six goals and three assists in this game. I wonder who the first star will be, Chris. <laughs> well, you know, nine of the 13 goals the Shamrocks have scored. Uh, just an absolute wrecking crew. Uh, you know, uh, it, it, it's, it's almost unimaginable that he has a twin brother that can do exactly the same thing. And you can imagine two of them on the floor at once. Well, you know, there's guys like Joe Montana, Wayne Gretzky, who seem to find the thing that they were born to do. And the Gate brothers, obviously. Oh, and there's a nice goal by Grant Johnson in front. But no, it's going to be waved off now. The shot clock had just expired, and we're going to have an argument now. I was going to say, people like the Gates, seem, some people get lucky enough to find the thing that they were born to do. And the Gates 
clearly were meant to play lacrosse on this earth. Well, and also, uh, the both Gate brothers uh, earn their living in lacrosse uh, these days and not just from playing. Here we're going to see a quick uh, replay here. Ball goes in front. The save, the ball went behind. I think that what the gamblers are saying, there should have been a, a new 30-second shot clock, and uh, yet the shot clock wound down, and now because the ball bounced off the back of Marty and really didn't hit the net, they're saying that the ball goes over to the Shamrocks. But yeah, Gary and Paul are, are probably two of the only players that make their living in the game. Uh, Gary at... Uh, Grant Pepper in front, shoots it just wide. Sorry, Chris. Uh, Gary at Gate uh, coaches the uh, University of Maryland's women's uh, lacrosse team. They also have their own company in lacrosse. They play... Uh, uh, in the major indoor lacrosse league and the states with the pro, pro league um, and really have earned their living the past oh five years or almost I guess since they graduated from Syrac Syracuse in the game of lacrosse doing a variety of things holding clinics uh, for the cut their company uh, they do some work for Nike uh, sponsored uh, I think by Toyota at times they they really have a variety of things that they do in the game and, and probably only the two of the only players in the world uh, earning their living from a game of lacrosse and you know, as uh, no, as uh, I was going to say notorious, but that's not right. But with the reputation the Gates have uh, in this area of the world, they're real celebrities on the East Coast. Uh, they're legendary on the East Coast. Uh, Paul living in Syracuse, uh, Gary and living in Baltimore, and they're absolute gods back there. Uh, the kids that flock around and the media attention they get is unprecedented for lacrosse players, both not only in Canada but in the United States. Steve Toll now, number 23, racing towards the goal, but he decides to slow it up. 9.08 to go in the third period. Shamrocks lead it 13 to 7. And if they can hold on, they'll win the Man Cup tonight. There's a turnover. The ball goes back to the Shamrocks with 9.02 to go. Just getting an idea of the, the prowess of the Gates. Uh, recently, the London Times of London, England, uh, published a list of the top 1,000 athletes in the, the history of the world, and the, and the Gate brothers were in that line list. And what a list that is. Here comes Gary Gate again in front, checked by Scott Ronson on a nice defensive play. Bob Watson thought of using... Bronson for the outlet pass there, but he was being checked, and so they decide they'd better try and set something up. They really need some offense here, and they're going to try and take their time and get a dangerous chance set up with eight and a half minutes to go. Grant Johnson with the ball. He's number 20 out on the outside there. Bob Fisher cutting for the net, takes the pass, shoots. Oh, nice save by Marty O'Neill. New shot clock for the Gamblers as they retain possession. Neat little back pass there, and Ronson, sorry, Fisher picks it up. Fisher heading for the net again, takes a shot in the back from Darren Rysig. Still twisting and turning, heading for the goal. Oh, and he went to shoot, and the ball had fallen out of his stick. Good work there by Bob Fisher, who's really showing a spark here in the third period. Less than eight minutes to go in the third period. 13-7 Shamrocks. Dell Halliday with the ball, waiting for some help as Fred Jenner joins him. Neil Dodderidge, Bruce Alexander, and Grant Pepper, the five-man unit out there. Jenner just knocked down hard in front of the net. Takes another shot as he gets up. The Shamrocks throw the ball around. Chris Pratt. Oh, a hard shot there from Fred Jenner. Goes just wide. Grant Pepper back at the net to get the ball. And the shot clock expires. That shot from Jenner went wide, so the shot clock did not reset. The ball goes back to the Gamblers. 7.28 to go. Andy Turner at center. Now the Shamrocks really know it's very close and almost in hand. They'll be very conservative now to make sure they don't make any mistakes to give the Gamblers an opportunity. Nice defense there from Dave Bremner. And the Shamrocks get the ball back again. Nice round of applause from the crowd, seeing the defensive play by Bremner. Really a intelligent lacrosse crowd here in Victoria. Well, they've been coming for a long time. They've watched some great lacrosse players. Like Tom Marichak, who just fires the ball low on the far side against Bob Watson. And now we've got the same score as we had at the end of game three, 14 to 7 Shamrocks as they convert yet another touchdown. Tommy Marichak, Gary Gate. Here we're going to see at the uh, replay. Tommy just gets the ball down low. It's a one-on-one -on -one situation. He comes back out, looking for the pick from Warren Blackwell. He stops before, confuses his defender, and just takes his shot from there. We well, said Gate and Marichek, the superstars that lead the team, and they really get it going, but the other players have answered the bell. The Rick Browns, Darren Reisig has played outstanding. Alton Davis, 
Other players, Fred Jenner and Dell Halliday, far too many weapons for the gamblers to deal with. Well, the fans really going now here at Memorial Arena, smelling the end of this Van Cup. 14 long years since the Shamrocks have tasted champagne from that solid gold trophy known as the Man Cup. Well, when the season starts to come to the end, uh, when it's been such a great season as this, you almost don't want to see it end, Scott, but it looks like it's going to in 6 minutes and 35 seconds. Well, the way the Shamrocks have played, they deserve to be done after tonight. That's Marichek's 15th point of the series. He's really been one of the stars. But the one star has been this guy, Gary Gate, number 22, and he's getting a great ovation from the fans right now, honoring this guy's talent, and he just gets better and better. Well, there's another nice setup for Rick Brown off the stick of Gary Gate. He's got the touch on his passes. He's got the power on his shots. He's got the smarts in his head. Gary Gate has it all. And the crowd recognizing that they're seeing one of the consummate performers in the history of the game of lacrosse, and acknowledging that every time Gary Gate touches the ball now, I think a real treat for you fans uh, out there that uh, watching on Shaw and Roger to be able to see this live, to see a player like the, the power and skill of Gary Gate and what he can do in a lacrosse game. And he just really single-handedly really took it over uh, at one point. And now the here he is again on a breakaway. He's everywhere. Kilgore back to cover him now. Pass for Halliday behind the back. Just a little too high. Halliday does take the ball off the boards. Tyson Lyas shoots and that goes wide. Gamblers retain possession, 5.23 to go now, and it's looking almost impossible for the gamblers here. But Dave Smith will try and get something going, number nine on the far side. Dave Smith will be happy to get a taste of Man Cup play, his first game of the series tonight, although it hasn't gone the way he would have liked so far. None of the gamblers will feel that way, but there's Randy Mearns trying hard. His shot stopped confidently, though, by Marty O'Neill, and O'Neill just doing his part to make sure there's no chance for these gamblers to come back. Now Coach Normal Dillon with 4.59 going to the game is going to call a timeout. Probably just going to settle his players down. If they begin an opportunity to get Bob Hayes in the game, uh, Shamrock's backup goaltender who we saw in game three for Red. And here comes Bobby. Marty goes out, gets a well-deserved hand for an outstanding series and an outstanding season. Marty's had a great series, and I think... The players are coming out now to congratulate Marty, patting him on his head. Everybody knows it's over. Marty can rest. They're hugging. Here we see the last, last replay. Randy Mertz switches hands. We see Marty make another big save, his last save of Man Cup 1997. As it's clear now, Scott, with 4.59 to go, that the Shamrocks are going to win this. And Marty uh, Nermal really... Doing a nice gesture for Marty by uh, calling a timeout, uh, getting Bob Hayes his day in the sun, and really uh, allowing the fans to acknowledge the performance of Marty O'Neill. Well, you saw Marty O'Neill on the bench there a moment ago with a big smile on his face, and nice to see Marty smiling after that headshot he took in the first period, but plainly he shook that off. Played a whale of a game tonight, and full value to O'Neill in his, for his part in this win. Well, I know Marty uh, will be happy to see this series over. He was taking a lot of heat from the media over his prediction, uh, which he was trying to duck out from under, uh, that he that would sweep the series, and when they lost... Game two, uh, I know there was a bunch of people I'm giving a little bit of heat, so after they make it in five games, he, he'll be a happy player. Well, Bob Hayes has only played uh, in one game so far. He's only faced two shots and saved them both, so a pretty good percentage for Bob Hayes so far, and he'll just try and uh, make sure there's no more damage done. The Shamrock's happy to leave the score the way it is. 14-7, to 7, 21 goals in the game. Tied, that's tied now with the most goals we've seen in any game in this five-game series. And of course, Bob Hazel be constantly reminding Marty O'Neill that he had a better shot save average in this series. Good team effort for the Shamrocks tonight. 12 of their 18 runners have points in this game, and the other six, is, the other six players contributing in their own ways as well. 
I uh, see a little bit of uh, pushing and shoving here. I think we're going to get referee Rick Lummis going to try and keep things under control here with four minutes to go. As the gamblers know, all is lost now, and uh, the referees will just make sure that nothing silly happens here in the last four minutes. And uh, the gamblers have really been a class act uh, through, this, through this series. Uh, it's very difficult uh, when you're down 14-7 and twice in a series you get blown out 17 to really maintain your composure. And Terry Sanderson has been a class all act all the way and really controlling his gamblers and telling them, you know, this is our first time. We maybe shouldn't have been here. We were lucky to have been here. We're a young team. Let's look at this as an experience. Let's really enjoy the, the experience we had in coming to here in front of jammed, crammed houses and, and, uh, and, and go away uh, feeling proud of our efforts. Well, Grant Hamilton took a penalty there for unsportsmanlike conduct as he shot the ball at one of the gamblers' players well after the whistle. So he goes into the penalty box for two minutes, less than four minutes left in the game now, and the Shamrocks just counting it down. And you can hear the buzz in the crowd. The crowd starting to realize that it's over and that they're seeing some lacrosse history here. The performance of Gary Gate, a legend in lacrosse. It's been a great experience for them. They waited for hours and hours in line for tickets to, for this series. And I think if this series went a few more games, they'd love that too. But well, just about 3,000 bucks in the 50-50 draw tonight. That's by far the biggest pot. This crowd is excited in more ways than one tonight. They've even opened their wallets. They're so excited. Randy Mearns on the outside fakes a shot for Rich Kilgore in close to Ronson. His hard shot blocked by Marty Oden. Sorry, Bob Hayes is in there now in goal. And he traps the ball and holds on to it. Hayes sends it down the floor. Marichek off the bench racing after it, but had a lot of top spin on it, that ball, and it bounced over Marichek's head. To Steve Finell, who gives it to Randy Murns, who heads down the floor with 2.50 to go in the game. 40 seconds left in the power play. Bronson in front tries a pass across. Rod Taft blocks that one. And here comes Tyson Lias. He's got a partial breakaway. Tony Henderson with him. Oh, and a nice save by Bob Wilson on the breakaway by Lias. Watson still standing strong in the air as he has throughout this series. He's really been under a lot of pressure with the number of shots he's been facing, but with 2.24 to go, he still makes a big save on a breakaway by Tyson Elias. Well, just seven seconds left in the penalty now, and the Gamblers will try and get a late power play goal, and they do as Scott Ronson from a sharp angle fires it low and right through Bob Hayes. So there goes Bob Hayes' perfect save percentage in the Man Cup, but he won't care. They're still ahead by six goals, and now we have had the highest scoring game in this year's Man Cup, 22 goals. You'll see a little replay of the power play. The ball goes down the shooter, down on the crease from Mearns. DeZormo a little late getting there and through the legs of Bob Hayes. Second goal of the game, number 18, Scott Watson. On the power play, the assist to number 16, Rich Kilgore. And the number 23, Steve Toll. And that's where he makes 17 minutes for eight, seven seconds. Kilgore and Toll assisting on that goal by Ronson. Steve Toll's fourth point of the night, two goals and two assists for Steve Toll, who has acquitted himself very well here in game five. But it's not going to be enough. With two minutes and 12 seconds to go, the Shamrocks have a 14-8 to eight lead, and we've had a timeout call. And there's Terry Sanderson now calling a timeout. 2-12 uh, to go. He knows the series is lost, but I think he just wants to tell his players what he'd like them to do over those last two minutes. He's telling them that it's been a long season. They've come a long way. They have a lot to be proud of. Let's make sure we go out with some class and say... We, we came and we saw, and now we can go back home and, and say we've faced one of the best lacrosse teams in the history of the game, I think, really, uh, the Shamrocks have showed us here, and, and go back and say, well, let's regroup, uh, take advantage of the experience that we've had and the thrill it's been to be here and hold our heads high. Well, in so many sports, Chris, we see a team, before they can reach the pinnacle and win the championship of their sport, they have to have some heartbreak first and become close and lose it. Uh, that seems to be one of the key ingredients for a team to reach the top of the mountain and take that trophy home. And the Shamrocks went through the disappointment last year. They're getting the rewards this year. Maybe that's the position that we see the gamblers in right now. You have to feel that these guys will be back and better down the road. Well, there's a lot of losing before you can win, Scott, and I, I think that's exactly what uh, Coach Terry Sanders has been saying, exactly what the Niagara Falls Gamblers can look forward to. Well, I'm going to mention some players that have stood out for me tonight, players like Del Halliday, Alton Davis, Dave Bremner, Mike Simpson, and uh, Rob DeZormo and Bruce Alexander. 
six prominent players tonight. None of them have a point, Chris, tonight, but it shows what kind of a team this Shamrock squad is. Here's a breakaway now for Steve Toll right in, and Bob Hayes played it well all the way, made the save on the high shot. That brings the crowd to its feet with now a minute 34 to go. And we're going to see a dog pile by the guys in green in just a short time. Now, Bob Hayes, a very popular player with these fans, and they love it. He's made some big saves before for the Shamrocks and makes another great save on a breakaway, and he'll be thrilled with that. 1.15 to go now, and the fans starting to rev up. They know what's going to happen here momentarily. 1.10 left in the game now. Nice. Tony Henderson. Not a lot of heavy checking will be going on here. The Shamrocks know they haven't won. The Gamblers know it's lost. And I see both players showing some classes. A minute to go in the game, Scott, and the fans start to stand. Well, the crowd going wild now as the clock counts down to just 45 seconds left. It's been 14 long years, Chris. There's got to be some goosebumps going on with you as well, as you were there for the last uh, the last Man Cup down on the bench. Must be a little different being up here in the booth. Well, though, it's still really exciting. I know how the, the feeling is. You still get the feeling here. The Shamrocks are just going to run the clock down with eight seconds go, give it back. The fans are standing and cheering. They have the last minute. It's an absolutely fantastic feeling for the city, for the community, for the club, its trainers, its executive, its managers, the players, the coaching staff. And the last 17 seconds, we'll just let you listen to the fans here while they go just crazy, Scott. Well, they are going wild. Just 10 seconds to go now. A late chance for Derek Graham. That goes wide. Five seconds left. The crowd goes wild. And there you see it. The Shamrocks' lucky green has turned to solid gold as Victoria wins the Man Cup. Part, not only the presidents and executives of the club, everybody makes a commitment. The training staff, day after day after day, players, coaches, managers, everybody 
has an integral part to play in winning a championship. I see Mason Sheldrake down there, a longtime director of the uh, Shamrock since the mid-1950s. He's seen the championships of the 50s, the 70s, the 80s, and now 1997, and I know he is just thrilled with this victory tonight. Well, you see the teams shaking hands at the center of the floor, and a lot of respect between these players. A lot of the players stopping to say special uh, thanks and congratulations to each other. Both teams acquitted themselves very well, and as we mentioned before, a lot of kudos must go to the Niagara Falls Gamblers as they're going to be back. Well, they're really a class team. This was a class series. We got to see lacrosse. Uh, we didn't get to see a lot of the rough stuff, which we don't want to see in the game. The players were able to display the fantastic skills and agility that, that we have. And so it really was a treat uh, for the fans. And Niagara Falls really was a class act when they came here and showed some great lacrosse skills. Uh, it would be nice if we could see those kinds of things more often from the East, but it's unfortunate that we only get to see it once every second year if you're lucky, and in Victoria, once in 14 years. Well, the shots in the game uh, final was 51 to 40 for the Shamrocks, 51 shots for the Shamrocks against 40 for Niagara Falls. 14 to 8 the final score. And not a, not a soul has left this building. They're gonna stand around now and watch this solid gold man cup be presented. Wow, it's a, a trophy, a cup that's worth over $70,000 in solid gold. It's been around since 1910. It was donated by Sir Donald Mann, who was the builder of the CN Railway for the Senior Amateur Lacrosse Championship of Canada, and it is well worth winning. Well, it sure is, uh, it sure is a well-deserved trophy. And uh, we should mention again, uh, we talked about him all night, but Gary Gate tonight, and I'll have to take a moment to count them all up. Six goals and three assists for Gary Gate tonight. 14 goals for the Shamrocks, and Gate was in on nine of them. And that's typical of the kind of absolute mastery Gary Gate has shown in the game of lacrosse through his whole career. Well, Gary showed us that uh, uh, one Gate and uh, it can carry a team to a national championship. They, Gates uh, carried Syracuse to... Uh, four national NCAA championships in their career at Syracuse along with Tommy Marichek. Uh, they've won mill championships, uh, they've won man cup championships, and literally we saw tonight that, can you imagine we said if they had two of them on one team, which they were for a long time, a, a coach's dream, but literally uh, singly they can carry a team. We saw Paul do that in North Shore Indians this year, and now Gary Gate has uh, led the Victoria Shamrocks to the, the holy grail of lacrosse, the man cup. Well, and we have to mention Neil Dotteridge, too. Now, not only the only man to have ever won six man cups, but he's won six in a row. What an accomplishment for number 21, Neil Dotteridge. Well, a real fine for the Shamrocks this year. Uh, played two years with uh, Brooklyn, uh, one with Paul Gate, I think, when they were uh, back east, uh, then won three in a row with the Six Nations Chiefs, and then decided to uh, move west this year and hooked up with the Shamrocks, and he was a real fine for them, wasn't he? And six championships in a row. I think Neil knows where to go where the best team is. Well, well worth the uh, 3,000 mile trip for uh, Neil Dotteridge and there's uh, 19 other, in fact more than that, some of the scratches out there now on the floor as well for tonight's game. The Shamrocks with a well-deserved uh, Man Cup championship, the first in 14 years for Victoria and we've, uh, we're just as happy as every fan in here tonight, Chris. It was a great pleasure to be here tonight. Well, I think we're going to go down to Norm LaBus now in the corner, and he's got a very special... No, no, we're not going to Norm, but we will soon. Uh, right now, the uh, celebration continues down on the floor. Some of the Shamrocks hugging each other, and some of the presentations are going to begin now. I know we'll have the player of the game presentations. We've also got the, uh, the uh, MVP of the series coming up. And now we're seeing uh, uh, Marilyn Monroe, wife of uh, the late Bill Monroe, who suffered a tragic heart attack um, at a lacrosse game this year in which the North Shore uh, Indians, whom he coached, scored a goal in the last second of the game and then suffered a tragic heart attack. A uh, huge loss for lacrosse, a huge loss for the North Shore Indians, and now his wife is here to uh, be part of the festivities and presentations. Well, another nice thing we're seeing, Chris, out there is a lot of the players have their children out there with them, carrying them all around on their shoulders, the, the kids wearing... Uh, Junior-sized versions of the Shamrocks jersey, and uh, it's not just these play, not just these players. Now, there's a lot of people happy about this. Let's listen to the awards. To the Niagara Falls Flyer, 
Former Shamrock goaltender, member of the Canadian Lacrosse Hall of Fame, Larry Smolcher.
upstairs and uh, silver medal presentation going on to the gamblers down there and still we've seen very few people leave Memorial Arena tonight there's a lot of uh, happiness going on here everybody waiting for the presentation of the Man Cup which is coming up momentarily and you know you've got to feel happy for uh, for certain players out there especially Alton Davis who we talked about who won his first Man Cup 14 years ago playing as a rookie with you as head coach and now here he is 14 years later with another chance and you have to feel great for a guy like Alton well, a long wait for Alton. I've uh, been grinding away, grinding away uh, 14 years. I mean, he had the thrill right when he uh, came out of junior, was coming out of a junior, and must have thought, well, Joe, this is easy, and <laughs> and uh, tasted the champagne from the cup and had to wait another 14 years before he's going to get that pleasure again. 
but he's really in a cast of uh, some great players. There's Alton, as you see on the screen, and and he's just really happy with everything. He wants to get the fans going a little bit and uh, say, hey, we've still got some energy left here. I'm enjoying this. I'm going to stay out here as long as I can to, to enjoy this moment. Uh, Gary Gate winning the Mike Kelly Award. Uh, I talked about uh, there's some legendary lacrosse players who won that. And now uh, Paul Gate, of course, Gary's brother, won it in 1995 with the Six Nations Chiefs. And now uh, Gary is uh, equal to the task. And these brothers just seem to follow each other around winning accolade after accolade. So now Gary uh, can have a matching Mike Kelly award uh, on his mantle uh, to talk to uh, Paul about and some spectacular players of, uh, there's Gary, as you see, uh, winner of the Mike Kelly award and a real prestigious award. Probably the most prestigious award for uh, a box lacrosse player in Canada to earn to be the most valuable player of a Man Cup series. Uh, uh, just something you'll cherish for a lifetime uh, along with the Man Cup. Uh, some of the other great players, of course, that are one of Jordy Dean, John Tavares. And here we go with the presentation, Scott. Of course, we're still going to wait. Or the fans are waiting, uh, Scott, for the Man Cup to be presented and so that they can stay and watch the victory lap with a captain who usually leads the way with a cup uh, above his head. Remember uh, front page uh, clippings of uh, Dennis Sumner, uh, the captain of the club uh, assistant in 1979, uh, Art Webster in 1983. It's always a, a picture that you keep in your scrapbook forever. Uh, go back a little bit to talk about uh, previous Mike Kelly Award winners. John Tavares has won three of them in the past five years. Uh, Darius Kilgore, who we saw tonight uh, but took an early exit, uh, won the Mike Kelly Award in 1994. The great Jordy Dean of the New Westminster Salmon Bellies. Uh, the New Westminster Salmon Bellies have won 24 times have won the Man Cup, uh, the most of any team really considered at one time the Montreal Canadiens of lacrosse. Um, and I guess in the last, since 1977, oh, this is the 20th year now that uh, no team from the West other than New Westminster and Victoria have won the Man Cup. In the last five years, uh, the Cups resided in the East with the Brampton Excel Excelsiors in 92 and 93, and, and the Six Nations Chiefs in 94, 95, and 96. So I know not only the Shamrocks, but the Western Lacrosse Association is happy to have the Cup back in the West, and what a great team uh, it's taken to win it. Well, another guy you have to feel happy for is Bruce Alexander, a real fan favorite here. You heard them chanting Bruce a minute ago as he got the gold medal hung around his neck. You have to feel great for Bruce as well. He's a big guy and a very effective player, and the fans love him to death. And a young player for the Shamrocks and the future of the Shamrocks. So Bruce will be around for a long time, still in college. He's on a field across scholarship in Mercyhurst in Pennsylvania. Uh, we'll head right back, I think, probably, if not on the red-eye flight. Well, he might have time to do a little bit of celebrating, but he'll have to be at classes at some time tomorrow. Uh, so he'll be on the plane uh, back east and continue his lacrosse. And some of these other players, of course, you think it's the end of the season for him, but uh, there's some players on both teams uh, of the Shamrocks and the Gamblers that are on Canada's national field lacrosse team, and they've got a training camp uh, coming up next week in Baltimore, Maryland, so they're off to switch games and play there. Uh, Twelve of the Shamrocks then have to go to uh, the field game and play for the Victoria Royal Waxman, or we're representing uh, Canada in the Brogdon Cup, which is the North American Club Championship for field lacrosse in, in Long Island, New York, and then they come back to finish their lacrosse season really in the National Club Field the Championships, which are being held in uh, Victoria. So they'll get a little bit of time to celebrate, but then they just sort of kind of switch uh, focuses and turn on the field game, and some of them going back to college and school, and some of them going back to their club teams. Uh, and the season's not quite over for them yet, although I know they're going to certainly take a few days off to enjoy this victory, Scott. Well, we also have to thank a school in Baltimore where Tom Marichek is a teacher. He had already taken a week off at the beginning of the school year and had to beg, borrow, and maybe steal another day to play here tonight. We, in fact, we weren't sure if Marichek would play in tonight's game because of his commitments in Baltimore. Uh, so so uh, the whole Shamrock squad, I know, would like to thank the school in Baltimore where Tom teaches because uh, he gave the gamblers a few lessons here tonight. Well, Marichek, of course, with Gate, the, the two superstar scoring threats that they have, uh, look, look of the two of the best lacrosse players in the world and and uh, Tommy I know there was some rumor that maybe he could only make the first four game of the series about the Shamrocks of course were 
tight-lipped about that, but Tommy's still here, and uh, looks like I think that if uh, Tommy would have been here for the duration uh, until the, the series was over. So Tommy really had a great series. Uh, uh, that's what uh, Gate and Marichek were here to do, was put the ball in the net to score, to lead the scoring, uh, while the other players uh, picked up the slack on defense and uh, the some of the other players that carried the Shamrocks to the Man Cup last year who were on the power play and superstar, superstars in their own right on that team. Uh, Rudy could actually uh, sit back a little bit and allow Gate and Marichek to carry the load from the bit and, and have not so much pressure on them as they did last year in back of Six Nations. I think we uh, should be getting close now to the moment that Everybody is still here standing and waiting for Scott, the presentation of the Man Cup, and it's a beautiful looking trophy. We see it over there glistening, solid gold, $70,000 and up is what the trophy's worth now. It missed, it went missing uh, about three years ago for a while in New Westminster, and there was a great scare that we thought that somebody had stolen the cup and had melted it down for its value, but uh, it, was it was recovered, and uh, now we're close to seeing the presentation. I'll tell you one thing, Scott, nothing tastes sweeter than sipping champagne from a solid gold cup. Well, and the team in green, the Victoria Shamrocks, are about to do that uh, once they hit the dressing room, of course, after the presentation of the big bowl on the far side of the arena. And it's, it's nice to see the uh, cup in the building here tonight. It's the first time I've seen it. And uh, a beautiful trophy it is, solid gold, as you mentioned. And like the Stanley Cup, it keeps getting bigger and bigger as they add rings to the base of it, making it a larger and larger trophy. But looking at the cup, as you and I did before the game tonight, Chris, you can see uh, that, and there it is, you see it now, you can see that it's just steeped in tradition, reading back all the way to 1910 to the first champions of the Man Cup. I think it was the Challenge Cup then. Uh, back in 1910, it was a challenge. Uh, the holders of the uh, cup uh, had to be challenged by... Uh, uh another club and then in 1925 finally went to the format of east versus west and it's been that format ever since as we mentioned at the outset uh, originally donated by sir donald mann who was the uh, builder of the cn railway in canada well now we see alden davis coming out onto the floor with his young son to a large round of applause from the shamrocks and as, as we mentioned there's another shamrocks player with Rick Brown. Small child Rick Brown, of course. And it's nice to see the players involving their families in this. There's a lot of people happy, not just those 20 players on the floor. The final presentation of the night. Well, we're going to go downstairs now. In a moment, we're going to go downstairs. Norm is going to have a very special guest. But first, the trophy presentation. but it paid off in the end. Normal, tell us about that moment a few minutes ago. You're hoisted on the team's shoulders. The crowd is going crazy like it is now. This has got to be a special moment for you. Third time and you got the cup. Well, there's nothing like it. This is a... I didn't know it could feel so good. It, you know, I think it'll really sink in tomorrow. Winning, winning the Man Cup, you know, I, I never realized how important it was to me personally, but it's such a wonderful feeling. And I feel so good for these guys because a number of them will be retiring next year and they got their they got their cup. Normal, the first two games the teams look relatively evenly matched. Coming out of that, the Shamrocks were so dominant so suddenly. How do you explain that? Well the first we had a twelve day layoff. They played a different type of game and we started playing their game 
when we had our meeting refocus and started our playing our game, running our three lines, they couldn't keep up with us. Uh, Tell us about this atmosphere, particularly tonight. Crowd counting off the goals, just going crazy. Well, if I was the other team, I wouldn't want to be playing here. They, they, they were just wonderful. They're the sixth person on the floor. When we came out the third period, he said, let's use the crowd for us. And they were just, as soon as we scored a goal, and the crowd started cheering, you could see them hanging their head, and I knew we had a one then. Now, this team, it seems, is like a family almost. You spend so much time together throughout the season. This has got to be just a re tremendously rewarding way to end off a season. Well, it's funny you should say that, because in that meeting, what came out of there is that our theme was we are family. Everybody in this dressing room is family. We're together till the end of this, no matter what. So what about the, some of the signs that are in your dressing room, in particular the one uh, pain is temporary, pride is forever. What, tell us about that. That was from Mason Sheldrick. He's the longest serving director on the team. He put that up, and the, the players really took that to heart, and they really put it in practice. Now, not only did the team's offense just explode, but the Shamrocks played so strong at both ends, you just shut the gamblers down. Well, that was our focus was defense. We knew we played good defense. We'd win it because our offense flows from our defense. Nermal Dillon, third time lucky winning the Man Cup. Congratulations. Thank you very much. That's Nermal Dillon, coach of the Rocks, the team taking their second victory lap with a broken Man Cup. We'll head back upstairs to Scott and Chris. Well, thanks, Norman. You're right. The cup is in two pieces now. And, Chris, we were noticing before the game, the cup has a few dings in it, much like a lot of trophies, I guess, that uh, have been around for as long as the Man Cup have. There were a few dings and knocks on it. You could tell it had been handled roughly before. And a little more of that tonight. Part of the history of this trophy, it's going to have to have a little repair work done, but it's still going to hold champagne, I think, tonight. Oh, yeah, I think the ball that just <laughs> come off the top of it there uh, as the boys are manhandling it around, uh, carrying it over their heads around the rink has come off, but there'll be a lot of champagne uh, flowing through that cup in a, in a minute. I know that the players really want to make sure that the fans got a good look at it because the fans in here in Victoria uh, have certainly been a large part of the success of Victoria Shamrocks, and so they want to make sure that the fans get just as much enjoyment, as long enjoyment as, as the players are going to have, so they're not so anxious to leave the floor because these people have, have supported them all year and, uh, and are having just as much fun, but it won't be long now as we see the pitcher being taken down down on the floor. It won't be long now uh, before they'll take that cup into the dressing room and the champagne uh, will be flying. The corks will be popping and a few people will be getting uh, wet. I'm glad I'm not going down there uh, just yet and Norm LeBus can maybe get down there and get uh, soaked with champagne but I know they're just waiting for that, that sweet taste of champagne sipping from the beautiful cup and uh, I've had the pleasure of of uh, chasing it a couple of times before, and I think um, before the night's out, I might go down and uh, just remind myself of how good it tastes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure they'd welcome you in there, Chris. Your history with this club is a long and successful one. And we mentioned it before, but you must have a few goosebumps right now as you see the team run to the dressing room. Well, I think, as I mentioned, the only, the only sad thing about it is it just seems to go so fast. You're there... You're, you're in the middle of the series and you really don't have time to reflect and understand uh, emotionally what's doing for you, but they're going to get the chance now. Well, downstairs, Norm LeBus is out on the floor and he's got tonight's player of the game, the player of the tournament, maybe the player of the world. Number 22, Gary Gate. Go ahead, Norm. Thanks, Scott. As you mentioned, we're with Gary Gate. Gary, the accolades, they just keep coming. Player of the game, MVP. Where does all this fit in in, the, in, in terms of your career, winning this at home? Oh, this is incredible. Um, you know, from the day that I uh, knew I was going to come and play here, I just knew it was going to be exciting. I had an opportunity to dedicate the season to uh, John Crowther, um, you know, to wear his uniform and, and to have this happen is just unbelievable. You know, the guys I played with, grew up with my whole life, and to come back and, and do it as a, as, a, as a team was outstanding. It's unbelievable. Let's go back to that then. Did you actually get a chance to play with John Crowther? You'd be a junior when he'd be with the Shamrocks. Uh, yeah, I played with uh, 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 John Crowther, and, uh, you know, he, he was an outstanding guy, and, you know, I was just so proud to wear his number out here and uh, to uh, help the team uh, bring home the Man Cup. Now, I've been watching you as the team celebrating, and, and everyone is just overjoyed, and, and you're wandering around with such a calm composed kind of demeanor has this set in yet no it's just my personality you know i'm kind of a mellow guy i try not to get too excited 
Uh, I think you can see that out on the floor, and uh, you know, I just, um, just it, it was just a great feeling, and, uh, and we're going to enjoy it for a long time to come. Okay, Gary. Gary Gate dedicating not only the championship but the season to the late John Crowther. We'll go back upstairs with Chris and uh, Scott. All right, thanks, Norm. Well, what a night it's been here at Victoria's Memorial Arena. Chris, uh, we know you're going to go down and join the team and uh, get your sips in on that cup. I'm a little envious of that, so uh, so have a good time. Well, I'll take you down, Scott. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, I'll look, I'll look forward to that, too. And I think Norm is down there as well. And, Norm, uh, pretty exciting night. It, uh, I'm a little jealous of you, too, being down on the floor with those guys. The, uh, the building now finally uh, wearing out, uh, sorry, emptying out. And uh, so, Norm, go ahead and tell us your final thoughts. <laughs> what an incredible experience to be down on the floor as the Man Cup's being rewarded. The, uh, the crowd just incredible, not only t t as the game ended, but throughout the series, counting down goals, thunderous ovation as Nermal Dillon gets hoisted on the team's shoulders. Just a great job all around by the team, the, the organization of the club to make this thing happen, and of course, Victorians to come out and support it. I thought it was wonderful, guys. All right, thanks, Norm. Well, that's it for us here, and uh, we just want to say thanks to everybody involved, the great fans here at Victoria, of course, the Victoria Shamrocks themselves. Chris, great job, invaluable having you here with us. Your experience was great. My pleasure. So thanks to everybody. Thanks to the whole crew, the camera guys, everyone in the truck, Norm and Chris. For everybody, I'm Scott Earl saying thanks for watching. Victoria Shamrocks, champions of the 1997 Man Cup. Bye-bye. <laughs>